Good morning all and thank you Chagas for the opportunity to speak today at this nursery stock seminar. I'm sorry I can't be live with you, government duty calls and our cabinet meeting is unfortunately taking place at the same time. I know it's been a very difficult year for the nursery sector. You've had to deal with COVID-19, labour shortages, input sourcing and cost increases and I want to acknowledge that. But thankfully you have also seen strong sales for amenity stocks and I understand the development of online sales with local enterprise support has helped in some way to mitigate some of the adverse effects. I am delighted that the 50% increase in funding I secured in 2021 has been maintained for 2022 scheme of investment aid for the development of the commercial horticulture sector. This scheme, as you know, aims to facilitate environmentally friendly practices, promote the diversification of on-farm activities, improve the quality of products and improve working conditions. It's 100% funded by the government and the 9 million in continued funding demonstrates our commitment to the sector. Of course, labour shortages have been a major problem for you. So I was very pleased to be able to work with my colleague, Minister of State Damien English, to secure a new tranche of general employment permit quotas, including 1,000 permits for horticulture operatives. The quotas are granted by the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment, with the condition that a strategic review on labour attraction and retention in those sectors is carried out. This is in line with the actions in Food Vision 2030, which contains actions aimed at attracting, upskilling and retaining workers in the agri-food sector, ensuring decent work and addressing labour shortages. Securing supplies of peat has been an issue for many in horticulture. I recognise that. And I also recognise that those in the sector accept the need to phase out the use of what is a finite resource. I therefore welcome the moves already being made by the nursery sector towards reducing peat usage. My colleague Malcolm Noonan, the Minister of State for Heritage, established a working group to address the issues around the use of peat moss in the horticultural industry. I understand that a final report from the chair of this working group has been sent to Minister Noonan and I look forward to the next steps following it. As I've said previously, I will continue to be supportive of exploring all options, including legally compliant small scale extraction for the domestic commercial horticulture sector only, while the sector is transitioning to a peat free future. Meanwhile, my department is actively looking at alternatives to peat. We have funded two research projects to date and the department's research call for 2021 included a call for further research on alternatives to peat-based growing media for horticultural production. As you are all aware, a new plant regulation came into operation in December of 2019. This was the first major overhaul of plant health legislation in over 40 years and provides more effective measures for the protection of plants from destructive pests. This new regime adopts a more coordinated risk-based approach to plant health and requires greater stakeholder engagement with my department. One of the main changes was the introduction of plant passports for all plants for planting when sold between professional operators. I know for most of you this created an additional administrative burden, while for others it was your first time to register with my department and issue these passports. I would encourage you to ensure any plants for planting that you purchase have the correct plant passports and are from reputable suppliers. This helps protect your industry and Ireland's environment. Ireland has a unique plant health status in the EU given that it has the highest number of protected zones in the Union, with 22 of them for various horticultural and forest pests and diseases. These protected zones allow us to keep quarantine pests out of Ireland that would cause an unacceptable economic, social and environmental impact if they were to establish. It off also offers the industry a strong marketing opportunity as Ireland is recognised around the world as having good plant health status. You all know as well as I do the importance of maintaining these protected zones and I would urge you to be cautious when purchasing protected zone host plants from other countries where the particular pest is established. If you have any doubts, please contact your local DAFM inspector for advice. There are many new and emerging threats to plant health. It is therefore essential that we are prepared and have appropriate measures in place to mitigate or manage those risks. In 2019, my department launched its plant health and biosecurity strategy, which is underpinned by three key strategic principles, risk anticipation, surveillance and awareness. 
one of the recommendations of the strategy was to establish a pest risk analysis unit. And I'm delighted that DAFM now have the capacity to prepare pest risk analysis and horizon scanning in line with best international practice. Indeed, I see that two of DAFM's officials from this unit will be presenting to you here today on the work of the unit. My department also performs risk-based surveillance for early detection in line with international best practice. In July, I introduced new legislation which sets out notification requirements on the arrival of certain plants and plant products from other European member states. These plants and plant products are host species of harmful organisms which are of a particular concern to Ireland. By notifying the department of the arrival of these plants and plant products into the state, you are playing a vital role in preventing the spread of destructive pests and diseases. This will help to maintain and further strengthen Ireland's favourable plant health status. That status is something we really want to protect. And indeed, I believe that events such as today's help us have the conversations and develop the common understandings that will help us do just that. So can I once again thank Chagas for giving me the opportunity to address you today and can I finish by simply wishing you all the very best for the rest of the seminar. So uh, today I uh, was asked to give a short presentation on new trends in growing media. And this is of course based on the, the Growing Media 2021 symposium we organized uh, this summer in Ghent. Uh, it was a hybrid conference due to COVID-19, of course. So we had like 70 participants uh, in Ghent and we had like 110 participants online. And now it's quite a duty to summarize these four days of seminar in only 20 minutes uh, presentation, but I'll try. So when you ask me what are the new trends in growing media based on the symposium, this is my very short summary. As you know, uh, the EU is working on a fertilizing product regulation. So to uh, indicate how you can use a CE mark, for instance, for growing media. So this is still work in progress, but it's more and more is getting clear what are, will be the criteria for this CE mark. Of course, we all talk about circular horticulture, and it means that we should look at water, nutrients, organic matter, how they can be used in a circular way. So I will come back to that in the presentation as well. Of course, we talk about structure or, or chemical properties of growing media, but of course the microbiology of growing media, it's gaining interest, but it's getting also more and more clear what is the added value of the microbiome of growing media. As mentioned before, of course, everybody is talking about peat replacement by local materials. So it is, of course, important to see what are the new trends there. And we cannot uh, give this presentation without talking about biochar because biochar is like the new kit in town. But it's, yeah, you love it or you hate it, uh, especially when you talk about growing media and biochar. So I will also uh, talk about this. And in the end, we end up with spent growing media in some cases, but in the framework of circular horticulture, we also have to think about the reuse, direct reuse, but also upcycling of spent growing media uh, to extend the lifetime, for instance, of peat, uh, coir, or other materials in growing media. So circular horticulture, and uh, sorry for showing a picture on, on a greenhouse with strawberries. Uh, although I know you are all working in the ornamental sector, but it's a, a good example, I think, of, of the importance of growing media and greenhouse cultivation or uh, protected cultivation in general, because this growing medium, it's key to having a high potential for recycling water and nutrients. And on the other hand, this small amount of growing medium allows to, to uh, for a very precise application of water, fertilizers, but also energy, uh, to the plants. So it's, it's really a very important uh, element in circular horticulture. But on the other hand, we of course, we need to progress to have a better closing of the cycle for, for water use, but also for the nutrients. So we have to think about um, nutrients that, that leave the greenhouse, but we also should think about the sources of nutrients that we use. For instance, maybe we should more use more and more organic fertilizers in the future. And one way of looking at this 
is as looking at growing medium uh, having different functions. So growing medium, of course, it, it gives structure to plant roots. That's its very important function, of course. But you can also give other functions to growing media. It can be a source of nutrients. It can be a source of biodiversity uh, for your plants. And it can help, of course, in that way for having a higher disease suppression. But even then, you can still uh, try to inoculate uh, the growing medium with additional biocontrol organisms. So organisms that allow your plants to have even a higher uh, disease suppression. So this brings us to the microbiome of growing media. And of course, we all expect that the growing medium is stable and stable stability, high stability, it means we want to have a low microbial decomposition activity because otherwise we can uh, have some problems with plant roots, for instance. On the other hand, we maybe might prefer to have a high microbial biomass in the growing medium, a high microbial diversity, and of course also a low risk of for pathogens. Sometimes we also would like to, to have beneficial microbial functions. For instance, there was one presentation on growing media where it was proven that when you add some compost and a, a core-based growing medium, it allows for to have a better nitrification, so a better conversion of ammonia of ammonium to uh, nitrates, which is better, of course, sometimes for plant uptake of, of mineral nitrogen. But on the other hand, it also reduces the pH of your mixes. So these microbial functions may be uh, beneficial for the quality of your growing medium. But of course, when you look at all of these aspects, there might be some contradiction, of course, because on the one hand, you want to have, to have a high stability, but on the other hand, you want to have a functional microbiology in your growing medium. And this is uh, presented here in this slide because, of course, we all know that there are a lot of um, plant or human pathogens. We, we, that might be harmful for the plants. We also have the beneficial organisms that we want to uh, promote in the growing medium. And for instance, uh, when we use uh, wood fiber and growing media blends, there is also a risk of, of having cyprophytic um, fungi, which may result in higher, higher hydrophobicity of your growing medium. So we have to balance these different groups of um, microbiology um, in the growing medium. <clears throat> When talking about microbiology, one promising uh, additive might be chitin. Uh, chitin is a chemical uh, substance that is available in fungi, but for instance, also in shellfish waste, as you can see here for the shrimp. And this chitin, well, it, it, can, um, it can stimulate biocontrol organisms. It can increase plant immunity and it can uh, result in higher disease suppression. But we also saw that chitin uh, can be an important source of uh, mineral nitrogen because during the decomposition of chitin, you get a lot of microbial biomass development, but also release of mineral nitrogen. On the other hand, this chitin can also result in imbalances between potassium, phosphorus, and the mineral nitrogen. So uh, we also saw that when you add chitin in higher amounts, for instance, it can uh, result in hydrophobicity. So it might be a promising uh, material to be used in growing medium, but it should be used with care, of course. Then uh, after having talked about the salt of the growing medium, maybe the, the chitin, the white powder, we now go to the black powder, the, the pepper of the growing medium. So it's about biochar. And the biochar, it can also have different properties uh, or, or functions in growing media, as you can see in the, in the picture here. Um, but it's very important to consider how you want to use the biochar in your growing medium. It, uh, it means you can use it in rather small amounts, and then it can work, for instance, for uh, disease suppressions. Um, it can use as, as a fertilizer, mainly of phosphorus and potassium, or it can work as a liming agent. In contrast, you can also use biochar as a bulk replacement. Uh, so you can really use it to like 20, 30% on a volume base and growing media. But depending on how you want to use the biochar, it's very uh, important to start from the right feedstock to produce the biochar. And of course, to use this to characterize the biochar in a good way and use it in the, the right conditions. Uh, so uh, do we know already everything about biochar for growing media? 
not of course not but there is gaining interest and in, and in how we can best use this biochar just to indicate that biochar is of course um it's a product but it's also um, a product of a certain process and this process this is it can provide us with heat uh, so with energy and that's very important for greenhouse cultivation these days because uh, you should really combine maybe the energy production during gasification with the proper use of biochar and growing media to have um, an economical viable uh, use of biochar and uh, horticulture. So, um, so both compost and biochar, they are actually uh, made based on, on uh, residual materials that are converted into stable carbon. Of course, the biochar has much higher stability of the carbon than compost has, but both of these materials can be used quite in a, a beneficial way in growing media plants. So in a nutshell, maybe uh, when we look at current uh, horticultural use of, of growing media, we all know that growers have to pay to have a good quality blend. Mostly it's maybe peat or coir based. So then we grow uh, ornamentals or strawberries and let's hope we get a good price for that. But at the end, in some cases, we end up with spent growing media for us, which we sometimes have to pay to get rid of the waste. For instance, if we talk about mineral wool or other uh, materials uh, which are, are not sold together with the plants, for instance, yeah, you have some waste material and a grower has to pay to get rid of this. Maybe we should dream of a new future where we start from sustainable growing media blends for which we have to pay because they are also high quality. We can grow good plants and get uh, good money for that. But maybe at the end, this spent growing media, they are still um, a valuable resource to be reused in the future. So maybe as a grower, you can still earn some money with your spent growing media. And for instance, you can then use it in, in different ways, as I will explain in the next slide. But what mainly important here is that uh, in what way you will reuse the spent growing media, it might also be a source of stable carbon. And of course, when we talk about carbon storage and soils, uh, we, we talk about um, yeah, trying to, to, to uh, reduce the effects of, of uh, climate change. And maybe as a grower, you can get also money because you store carbon uh, in a stable way in, in uh, arable soils. And it should be, of course, very good in the end for the planet um, and also for the grower. So this brings us to the story of the spent growing media. Uh, because, of course, when you talk about a growing medium blend, uh, it can have different characteristics based on the composition. But at the end of, of the cultivation, of course, you end up with spent growing medium, which tells the story of the past cultivation. So it, the spent growing medium may contain salts, uh, residual nutrients, chemical plant protection residues, plant roots, of course, but maybe also pathogens. So these characteristics you should take into account uh, when you want to reuse uh, or upcycle spent growing media. So we can reuse this spent growing media direct as a soil improver, so as a source of stable carbon. Plus, but please keep in mind that they may already contain a lot of nutrients uh, that you should also take into account uh, when you um, make your fertilizer planning for your, uh, for your fields. Of course, you can also try to sanitize uh, your spent growing medium, for instance, by steaming and then directly reuse it. So we have a case study in Flanders where uh, spent growing media from strawberry are steamed and then they are used to grow uh, chrysanthemums uh, and it works. So this grower is very happy with this system. You can, of course, use the spent growing medium as a bulking agent for composting. Um, because it's it's a uh, yeah it, it's a good material for using and, and, and compost and this compost can then be used for land application but maybe also in, in growing media again and of course you can convert spent growing media into biochar and in all of these cases of course um, whatever scenario you choose it will affect the the what happens with the carbon and to end the spent growing medium but also with uh, what happens with the nutrients in the spent growing medium. So 
This brings me to the, the poll that we had during the Growing Media uh, Symposium. So we had uh, 150 participants who were uh, asked to poll and uh, half of them um, yeah, answered the polls. And we had some very um, um, uh, yeah, fascinating answers from the audience. For instance, the first question, it was whether we should only focus on peat replacement when we talk about sustainable growing media, or we should also take other materials like coir or mineral products into account. And like 75% of the people said, yeah, we should not only focus on peat, but also on coir and other mineral products. Um, and then, yeah, maybe look at, at the local or regional alternatives um, for, these, uh, for these materials. Um, I will go further because uh, time is running uh, up. So maybe the fourth question, it was about the role of microbiology when you do a sustainability assessment of growing media. The question was, should we include this microbiology as a criterion? Also here, the majority of the audience said, yes, we should include it uh, because it's very important um, to, to look also at the microbial functions of growing media. Um, so I can uh, give you all answers that people sent uh, to us, but for now I will only summarize uh, mainly it. So um, maybe the, the question eight was also a very clear answer. So we asked whether the end of life or spent growing media should also be included in a sustainability assessment. So what happens with the spent growing media? Uh, also here, more than 75% of the people said, yes, uh, you should uh, include the end of life and the sustainability assessment. So that's, that's also a very clear answer, I think. And then maybe the two last questions, they were related to um, how you apply uh, fertilizers in growing media or how you apply water in growing media, whether the, the system that you use as a grower, will it affect the, the feasibility of uh, for instance, peat and coir replacement by other materials. And in both cases, the audience indicated, yes, it will be very depending on the system of fertilizer or water application, how successful or how fast you can uh, make the transition from a peat-based or a coir-based growing medium to other uh, new blends. So I will very, very shortly uh, introduce you to the Horty Blue Sea project. It is an Enterech project. Uh, that is um, running, uh, well, it, it is now in the last weeks of its execution. Um, and in this project, we tried to upcycle uh, several materials, so residual materials, uh, into building blocks, blocks for growing media. And for making these building blocks, we did different um, production processes like gasification, chitin extraction, defiberization, things like that. And based on that, we made building blocks with different functions uh, in growing media, uh, like fertilizer or maybe disease suppression or other functions. Um, and based on these materials, we, we built uh, four valorization chains. So there is one valorization chain on biochar production and use in growing media. There is one on chitin uh, production and use in growing media. The third valorization chain is on the upcycling uh, of spent growing media. And the last one, it's on bulk replacement in growing media. So bulk replacement of peat, coir, or mineral wool by uh, other materials. So based on these four uh, valorization chains, we had four webinars. Uh, it means three of them are already um, are passed, but the last one, it's next Tuesday. So you still can register for that for free. Um, and for those who want more information on these webinars, so for each of the webinars, we have uh, the recordings available on the website together with the websites and the presentations. So here you can find the links to these webinars. Um, and if you want even more information on the building blocks, uh, for each of the building blocks, we have a, a video available. We have papers uh, open source available. And there is also a decision tool that can help you and make uh, a decision on whether you, how to process a certain material into a building block. Just to inform you that uh, on the last webinar, we will talk about uh, the greenhouse trials we did with tomato and uh, strawberry, so where we um, 
tested actually the new blends versus the reference blends being, being peat, coir, or mineral wool. Uh, so all this information is also on the website or will be provided next week during the webinar. So this brings me to the last uh, slide. So if you want more information on uh, the Growing Media 2021 uh, Symposium or a Hearty Blue Sea project, uh, you can find this here on these links. And we also have a YouTube channel with a lot of information. So please, uh, if you have any remaining question, you can, of course, always contact me or you can follow us on uh, Twitter. So thanks for your kind attention. Um, the next speaker is Kevin Mann. Uh, Kevin is Managing Director of Classman Deal and Growing Media Production Facility in Rathorne County, West Mead. He's well known to the industry. You're very welcome, Kevin. Um, Classman Dealman are a global growing media company based in Germany to produce professional growing media. He has helped introduce lean production methods in recent years, and lately the business has obviously pivoted towards uh, introduction of alternative materials in peat uh, growing media. Um, and it'll be very interesting to hear what Kevin's perspectives are in terms of this sector and, and the direction of travel that we're, we're currently on. Thanks, Kevin. Thank Thanks very much. That's great. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I'm talking to you as a managing director, as a, an operations guy rather than a, rather than a, a technical uh, person. So I'm just the talk I was asked to talk on what lies ahead. And as has Bart has focused on as well, looking at the alternatives that we're using and more recently actually having to import peat into Ireland as well. So just to give a little overview of us as a company, um, yes, we're German based. We've been around since the early 1900s. Uh, we have several factories in Germany, uh, one in Holland, Belgium, uh, Lithuania, and we've just put in planning permission for a new one in, in Latvia. We also have uh, opened a factory in France. And uh, this year we acquired a non-peat business in Australia, wood-based substrate producer in Australia. And that's kind of our direction of travel. We've been in Ireland for 40 years. Uh, we're only focused on the professional market. So we're not involved in retail whatsoever. And Plasman actually has a, a history in Ireland that goes back to 30s because we we supplied the initial machinery to the turf develop, development board back in 1937 so the first harvesting equipment that was used for commercial peat extraction in ireland was classman machinery as you can see from this slide we are reducing our dependence on peat uh, last year we had so this is the group figure so we we had over 3 million cubic meters um, in previous year we're down to under 3 million, so 11% decrease in peat. Our primary alternative is wood fiber. Um, after that, we're also using green compost and um, coir. The container mulch is a mulch rather than a growing media. But of course, we're using other things like bark, vermiculite, perlite, um, and increasingly use coir. Oh, sorry. So the, the reason we've been focused so much on peat in horticulture is there's really nothing as good as it so far that we've found. It's excellent water holding capacity, good aeration for the, for the soil, and also because for, for plant root development. And also because of uh, the low starting pH, it's very easy to set the, the pH to the requirements of the crop. So just to add the right amount of lime. It's very stable, it's consistent, it's reliable, uh, which cannot be said for a lot of the alternatives. So the, it's, it's a very homogenous uh, product. The other thing for us, which is really important is because over 45% of our production goes into the food sector. So for growing lettuce, uh, brassica, a lot of young vegetables, herbs, so 45 to 47% of our production is in the food sector. So safety is so critical for us. And we're all the time testing for human pathogens. 
The one thing about peat is we really don't have to worry about that. Of course, we test it and we test our wood fiber and all our other materials, but really it, there's no risk of pathogens or extremely low risk of pathogens in, in peat. It's also commercially, it's very efficient. Uh, we can gather about 600 cubic meters per hectare in, a, in, a, in an average sort of season. Um, it's available locally. Uh, we can get typically 90 to 100 cubic meters on a truckload, so relatively low transport costs. Again, some of the alternatives are heavier. Uh, we can hold stocks for, for quite a long period of time. So given the Irish vagaries of the Irish weather, we could have two bad summers in a row. Typically, we're aiming to hold two to three years of peat in stock to cover those, um, those periods. Um, we're still using peat that we harvested in 2019 at the moment. When I say once managed, there can be a loss of quality. Over time, it gets heavier. And um, also for temperature management. So we have to have probes in the peat to monitor it that it doesn't get too um, hot. It, it can damage the quality. The constituents that we're using, these are the main alternatives that we incorporate with our peat, or we're also doing peat-free as well. So the first four items listed there, they're all coconut based. Um, buffered coir for certain crops, we need to have it buffered. For a lot of our peat free mixes, we would just use wash coir, coir it's not buffered because we're adding other materials like uh, clay that provides a buffer. And then just different cocoa structures. Wood fiber, as I said, is our, our one of our main um, peat alternatives as is green compost. We use, in certain factories, we use pine bark, which we bring in from Portugal. And uh, we've also been using um, bark, which we compost on site. That's uh, throughout the group. Um, perlite, vermiculite, again, they're more expensive materials and we're using them um, in specialist crops. We're also adding clay and, and sand as required. Wood fiber, just to say a bit about our wood fiber, is the good thing about wood fiber is it's very open, free draining structure. So you get nice dry pot tops. So it discourages liverwort and algae. Um, get very good root development because it's a, a, an open structure. We can buffer it quite well. This is just um, an example of uh, a trial that we did. So on the left hand side, it's a, 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 a plant with grown in 100% peat. In the middle, it's 25% wood fiber. And the, on the right-hand side is 35% wood fiber. So you can see that the root ball has developed much better with the higher level of wood fiber. Now, if you start going beyond 35, 40%, it's, it's suboptimal. And really what's doing that is just, it adds extra uh, drainage and aeration to the substrate. Um, we're also using increasingly using coir, and uh, we've been using it for more than 25 years within the group. The coir that we use is uh, certified as ethically sourced under SA 8000. We use mainly wash coir in Ireland, but we do have buffered coir available as requested. It's a lot more expensive. Um, again, if you have the quality right, and we do, uh, we can get a good quality the pH is higher so, than peat, so it's not suitable for all crops. Um, but in general, I'd say for most crops, crops it is a true replacement. Um, unlike, for example, the wood fiber growing plants in 100% wood fiber wouldn't really be optimal, whereas you can do most crops in 100% coir. Um, the biggest problem we have is the availability, the cost of transport. In the past six months, the the containers of coir we got in March were three and a half thousand dollars just for the transport. We're getting coir in next week. It's over seven thousand dollars just for the transport. And so that's and just the, a lot of growers, particularly in the Netherlands, and I've heard in the UK as well, they very bad experiences with quality issues. So the coir that was shipped in 2021 was poor quality. So as a result, we've actually picked up a lot of business in the Netherlands in the strawberry sector, which typically would use coir. So there's been actually a reversion to peat and wood fiber based mixes in the strawberry sector in, in the Netherlands as a result of the problems with coir. 
um, I mentioned there and Bart, Bart alluded to it as well. There are concerns now that focus on coconut. Coconut is primarily used for coconut oil and it's kind of been tarred with the same brush as palm oil. So there are ethical concerns about coir and we are seeing growers saying they want not just peat free, but coir free, so. Uh, green compost, we've been producing this for 30 years in Germany. Um, it's all, the, the critical thing is the source material, that it's clean. And as I say, our focus on the food sector um, makes it that we're concerned about pathogens. So at least we have a very good consistent source of green uh, waste from Germany. Um, Bart has mentioned a lot of it. So there are uh, beneficial microbes in it. So it helps with uh, suppress root diseases and it's a source of nitrogen. Bart covered a lot of the positives of, of, of the product. So other constituents, and again, some Bart has referred to a few of them already, so I won't dwell, but, and again, it's local for local. So in countries where they produce rice, uh, rice husks are used. Again, there's increasing competition from the energy sector. We have the same problem with our wood fiber. Our wood chips are being burned for energy use and they can make more money out of energy than they can from some in the horticulture sector. Rock wool is obviously used. Again, it's a very, requires a lot of energy. It's very expensive. So it's not really a practical alternative for most places, for most uses. Digestives are increase, increasingly being looked at. Again, it's not something we use because of our exposure to the food sector. Biochar, as was mentioned by Bart. Plant fibers, uh, so miscanthus, hemp, things like that, they are being used um, as, as a portion of, of um, peat replacement. Sphagnum moths, I have a separate slide on that because it's a product we're very interested in. Um, Xylit is, is uh, just woody product that's in young coal, but brown sort of coal. It, again, it's not really a sustainable product. It's not something we're interested in. Cork granules, excellent product, but it's very expensive. So it's only really used in specialist high yielding crops. Um, the other thing that's been developed now are bio-based polymers, things from um, starches, from uh, corn-based starches, that sort of thing. Um, I will focus a little bit on sphagnum because we've, we've done a lot of work on sphagnum. So obviously we've regrown our peat production fields, particularly in the Germany, Germany and the Baltic. We've uh, regrown back the moss on, on over 12,000 acres that we've re-wet in Germany. So we've a lot of experience of growing back the moss on peat fields. It's all about water management. This particular project about growing the moss to use as a growing media, we started in 2015, we worked with them technical institutes in Germany and with the University of Hanover. So it was a project not just about growing media, but it was also to gather data about our greenhouse gas emissions from our peat fields. So to compare the before and after. So we've, we have a sustainability report, which we produce every year to show exactly what our, our um, carbon emissions are. And this, this contributed a lot to our understanding of the emissions from our peat and our bog and the life cycle analysis, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so it's actually the um, sphagnum moss, we found it to be, of all the materials that we've used, we found it to be the best. Now there are problems with it in that it, um, it's very slow growing. So it's very expensive to produce uh, very, um, and we, the machinery yet, it hasn't been developed to harvest it efficiently. So it's not currently economic, but it's an excellent growing media. And it's one that we're very interested in developing. When you grow it out in the field, it does have problems with weed issues, but if it's been grown in greenhouse conditions, you can overcome that and it will grow better in greenhouse conditions. So it's definitely something we're focusing on. Um, just, I thought I better say a word about this because is we are bringing peat in from the Baltic. So it's something that, um, growers are going to have to get a, used to. It is like adding other materials. It's, it performs differently to Irish peat. So it's just something that we have to draw people's attention to. And it's not just from Classman. Other companies will be using Baltic peat because clearly the avail availability of um, Irish peat is uh, becoming limited and may be unavailable. Um, so we, we brought in a ship to Drogheda in September. 
It had about uh, 20,000 cubic meters of peat, roughly speaking, 200 truckloads. And I just wanted to put that into comparison to some of the alternatives that we would use. So for us to get 20,000 cubic meters of bark, it would take us two and a half years to build up that volume of bark because we're on, we're on an allocation of bark from our supplier because we want top quality bark. And it's, uh, we only get three loads a week. And when it composts down, it, it, um, it breaks down. So th that's how long. Green fiber, we produce it on site, but it's a slow process. To produce 20,000 cubic meters of green fiber, 200 truckloads, it would take us five months of constant production, practically 20 hours a day. If we were to purchase the same volume of coir, 20,000 meters of coir, it would cost us three times the price of the Baltic peat. And by the way, the Baltic peat is extremely expensive uh, with the cost of transport. So we could have collected 20,000 meters of peat on the peat field beside our factory. In ideal conditions, we could have done it in 10 days and it would cost about quarter the price of what the Baltic peat costs. So that's just to illustrate the absurdity of what we're doing. Um, that's a picture of the Baltic peat that was loaded in Riga um, on the bog there. As you can see, it's physically, it's lighter in color than the Irish peat. It's lighter in weight. It's only about 200 kilos a cubic meter as opposed to 300 or 250 for Irish. It's a softer structure, so it breaks down. There's less sphagnum in the, the mosses that grow over in, in, in the Baltic. So it contains more liverworts and other types of mosses. So it's more, it breaks down. You'll see shrinkage. Maybe if you've got plants in from the Netherlands that's generally Baltic peat, you'll notice they shrink more than Irish peat does. Um, it also contains more wood and sticky bits in it. The water uptake is, is poor as well. So like in our factory in, in Lithuania, they would double dose, they would use double the dose of wetting agent as we would use here in Ireland. So that's just something to take into account as well. It is safe, it's clean, and obviously it's available. Um, and we may have to start incorporating more and more of it as our Irish peat runs down. Um, just things about growers that just to take into consideration about introducing those alternatives, and particularly if you're looking at peat-free, Availability is the biggest single issue. We can produce peat free, but if everyone wants to go peat free in the morning, we just wouldn't have the material to do it. Um, the main thing about peat free and, and heavily peat reduced is about managing the water and the, the uh, nutrient management. So typically with a peat free mix, you, it requires about 30% more water and 30% more fertilizer. So you get more leaching more leaching of nutrients out. So you have to compensate for that because the buffering is just not as good as with peat. Now we put in clay and things like that to help buffer. That's, that's the main thing. Also, when you're introducing these organic materials, you get more pest problems. Like peat is relatively inert. So you have you've issues like with scarred fly and things like that. And the main thing we would say is just take your time, start slowly, introduce, you know, 20, 40% peat, uh, non-peat, first of all, before, don't go headlong into it, because it, it's, it's just, it's something that really has to be managed, that transition, and certainly we will work with growers, we, we collect samples, we get the lab results, we come back and say, this is what you have to add to tweak to get back your crop on track, so we work with growers, but it's very important that the crops are monitored, you can't just treat it the same as peat. Sorry, I've, I lost track of time. If I'm over, I apologize. Okay, no, that's fine. Well, that's good. That's, I'm at the end. If, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay, Kevin, thanks. Um, yeah, can, can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. Kevin, I just had a question there in terms of a distinction between professional. Maybe if you stand over there. Okay, thanks. Uh, the distinction between professional and the retail market for Pete. It's something, it's a point that isn't necessarily um, uh, known that well from an audience outside of the horticultural industry. The fact that we have, that you supply only professional peat. I think there's been a lot of uh, questions uh, about the fact that there have been exports of peat all the while, while you're importing peat for the professional sector. 
Could you say a word about that and put a bit of emphasis on that for us? Yeah, well, I, I know certainly one of the things that was put out there uh, some weeks ago was a press release uh, from Friends of the Irish Environment about uh, the peat exports. Now, you have to read, read the exports. First of all, Borden Mona has been the, by far the largest exporter from the island of Ireland. So their exports continued right up until the end of June. The other thing is that um, in terms of peat exports, uh, the way the commodity codes work, you have to, if it's more than 50% of peat, you have to record it as peat. So like we, we're typically, we're on track with 20% non-peat in our mixes, but it's all recorded as 100% peat. And the other manufacturers use the same commodity codes we have to. So it, it is, gives an overstated um, um, amount of peat. In fact, if you look at the monthly statistics, the uh, reduction in exports this year is probably going to be about 40% less than last year. And the other thing, bear in mind the imports, the imports have only just started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, the imports are gonna increase hugely sure. in the coming period. And the distinction between, sorry, retail and professional, it's the same, Pete, but it's the way you manage the bogs. And uh, just obviously the, the re quality requirements of professional growers are much higher. Mm -hmm. So they need um, a standard consistent weed free product sure so that's just retail and in so terms good. of the new feedstocks that you're bringing through in terms of blends how do you manage that how, what's the challenge around managing that batch to batch consistency consistency yeah look something like wood fiber is pretty easy to manage and we only take our wood chips from one supplier we mm. take our bark from one supplier so it's just easier to manage that way we get a consistent so it's all to go back to the source material mm. and how you can trust that so we we know and that's why we don't want to get into green compost in ireland it's just too variable too unreliable unreliable but whereas wood bark we're comfortable with that um, wood fiber, as I say, it's consistent. Coir, again, Classman has its own coir company. It's a consistent quality. It's all uh, ethically sourced. So we, we're, we have confidence in what we use. So we'd sooner not sell. So we, the, if we don't have the right quality, we won't sell it. And that, that's the way we manage it. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Anybody in the audience or, or elsewhere with a question? It is quite significant. That's true. Yeah. I just repeat the question for people online. Yeah. Uh, the question, sorry. The um, question relates to. The que yeah. Uh, sorry. The question relates to the shrinkage of Baltic peat versus Irish peat. Yes. It, it, I actually have a picture on my laptop. I should have probably included, which shows the shrinkage over a two-year period. So it it shrinks probably at twice the rate of the Irish peat. Yes. And that's, it's a younger peat and there's more of these uh, mosses that just, uh, it, it emits more carbon effectively uh, and uh, it breaks down that way. The other thing is it's, it's softer, so it does, it, it gets finer than Irish peat. It doesn't hold the structure as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. Um, Next up, we have uh, Dr. Michael Gaffney from our very own uh, Chagas Horticultural Development Department. Uh, Michael is working in this area and in lots of other areas as well, and his extensive experience of working in a range of pests in the Irish horticultural industry, as well as some external influences of soil, nutrition, biochar, and growing media. He's recently worked on the Best for Soils Interreg project to develop decision support tools for managing soil, uh, borne pests, and diseases of horticultural crops. So, Michael, it's over to you, and thanks a million. Thank you very much, Dermot, uh, and hello to everyone. So I've just been asked to give a quick run through about what... Thank you. I've just been asked to give a quick run through about what... Okay, apologies. We've been asked to just give a quick run through what Chagas uh, as an organization feel are the research challenges when we come to looking at reducing peat use in the professional horticulture sector in Ireland. So obviously, just as has been mentioned, peat um, in horticultural production has been a critical component in the development of containerized growing um, since the 1960s. Again, has been mentioned, there's many beneficial properties. It's a low bulk density, low pH, low EC, low cost, and readily available. So it was, a, and also had very good shelf life. So it was a material that could uh, suit it very, it was very predictable in everything that it did and it suited growers very well. And as such, many systems and processes around professional horticulture were developed in tandem with the use of peat as a growth media. 
However, there, due to environmental concerns and other issues um, across Northern Europe, there is a move and a recognition that we need to transition from peat into alternative materials. And in some countries, such as the UK, they have a voluntary scheme to reduce peat use in the professional sector up to 2030. And there are similar targets in other countries like Germany, uh, where they're, they're all working towards that, that timeline. And what that will really mean is that there's going to be an increased demand across Northern Europe for alternative materials to peat within that, within that time frame. Therefore, there's a need, we need uh, in Ireland to identify and evaluate materials that can dilute and potentially replace peat over time. Uh, and also would be preferable is materials that we could source on the island of Ireland, because as I've mentioned, there will be an increased demand at a European level and even at a world level for alternative materials. So while, and also while research is essential and uh, developing protocols and evaluating materials, there's also a need to really work in terms of knowledge transfer and grower to grower or peer to peer learning in this space, because it is a, a very big challenge and it will require uh, all stakeholders uh, working together to try and find alternatives. So what are we looking for when we're considering alternative materials? They need to be agronomically acceptable. We need to be able to produce high quality plants. They need to be available. Um, Kevin just said, as Kevin outlined before me, you know, there is a real need to develop. A, uh, there is a real need that the materials are readily available. And also he, he outlined very, very well the cost they mentioned. There is no point working from a research perspective on materials that aren't available and will be uh, available at a cost that is not compatible with the economic scenario of producing plants for retail up in Ireland. Now, if we can find materials that fulfill all of those criteria, excellent. And what we've learned also with the, with the peat issue over the last few years is that we need to underpin everything through sustainability and measuring sustainability. Uh, and in Chagas, we would like to use methods such as life cycle assessment, uh, which really is an environmental tool or a tool, sorry, to measure environmental impact of the process of any material. And we would, um, what we would hope to do with any material that we look to uh, contribute uh, towards in terms of research time, that they, those process, that those materials go under a life cycle assessment. So the availability of alternative materials, um, it's estimated that there's a need within the professional horticulture sector of anywhere between 180,000 to 250,000 meter cubed of material. Uh, to fulfill the Irish professional horticulture sector. I understand that there's a lot, a lot of uh, discussion around these figures, so I'm fully willing to be corrected if, if people don't agree with those figures. But anyway, it is a significant volume of material. Uh, to put it in context, it's, it's, it's greater volume of material than all of the food waste produced in Irish households in a year. So it is a considerable amount of material that we're looking for. There, there will be an initial challenge in identifying candidate materials, and we'll need some rapid assessments such as um, the availability, the bulk density, the pH and the EC of these materials. We'll need to be able to assess them quite quickly. And we need to give consideration too that some of these materials will have alternative uses, such as woody materials uh, in fuel and home heating. How we'll try and identify them is through national reports from agencies such as Quilja, SEAI, BAFM, and also use maybe some more modern tools, such as uh, this map here recently produced uh, in, in conjunction with Chagas um, on the Biomap project that lists all of the kind of actors within the Irish bioeconomy and the kind of materials that they use. So in this map here, you'll see all the brown uh, pins. They illustrate companies that work with woody materials. So therefore they may have waste streams available. The yellow dots indicate companies who are in the food and beverage sector. And again, materials such as spent brewer's grains, spent distilling grains, they may have potential as a feedstock within growing medias going into the future. And maps like this are very useful in, in helping us to identify uh, companies that may be producing waste that we can utilize. This has been gone through a bit, so I'll, I'll just go through it very quickly. But what are we looking for when we're looking for alternative growing media? Well, they have to have good physical, chemical, and biological properties to allow good, uh, good and vigorous root development. So in terms of physical structure, we're looking for materials that give us a good level of balance of air and water. They have a high pore size, they have low bulk density, um, and they have the ability to both hold and release water in a predictable fashion. Um, and we, from a research perspective, there's a lot of methods that have been developed to measure these uh, aspects in peat, but we do need to have a look and see if these methods hold true when we're trying to uh, apply them to alternative materials and peat-free materials. We also need to look at the chemical characteristics. So again, as we mentioned, peat is beneficial in that it has a low starting pH and it can be easily um, altered. Some materials such as the green wastes and bio wastes, they have a much higher starting pH. So again, that can be problematic. 
Um, and in general, we're looking for materials that have said that have low EC, uh, low nutrient availability and a high buffering capacity if possible. Uh, in terms of biological properties, really what we're looking for is materials that are stable. And if you look at the graph on the right, this is some work that we did a few years ago where we used the oxygen uptake rate method to measure the biological stability of a peat compost. And that's the green line here. And as you can see, the material is quite flat. So that indicates quite a microbiologically stable uh, material. This purple line is a well composted green waste. And again, you can see the line is falling towards the axis. But again, this is a material that we would consider quite stable. And what we're trying to avoid potentially are, are feedstocks and materials that are unstable. So this red line here is also a composted green waste, but it's actually a relatively unstable material. It's got an OUR value of 33. And I've just put this graph in to show that both of these were sourced composted green wastes. And I think as Kevin uh, mentioned, you can see the variation in the, in the material in that one is quite a stable material and one is quite an unstable. And if that material was to be included in a feedstock, um, it, potentially you'll get slump, nitrogen immobilization in the growing media. So again, um, predictability within the materials and the feedstocks will be essential. There's also an issue to look out for things such as weeds, pests, et cetera. Also, when we're looking for alternative materials, we need to understand how they'll perform within the, within the nursery environment. So peat was also was a very good, a very low risk material for growers, uh, produced predictable results and predictable plant growth. And that was essential when you're running a business to sell plants. But we also, so we need to find materials that have similar properties, but also we need to take into account the type of irrigation systems that are on nurseries, the type of growing media handling equipment that's already on nurseries. And also we need to finally understand the, what the growers are, sorry, excuse me, what the customer, the appearance of the material and what the customer will accept. So again, these are all real, real considerations that probably go beyond pure research, but also go into the knowledge transfer aspect. Of, so I, I think I'm just, what I'm trying to do here is just uh, illustrate the level of the challenge that it is when you're trying to introduce alternative materials into the sector. There's many other things beyond just agronomy that need to be considered. So some of these have already been mentioned, so I'll go through them very quickly, but I'm taking here from a review by Barrett et al, uh, done about five years ago, but it just outlines many product, uh, many materials that have been put forward as potential replacements for peat um, and have been mentioned already today. So things like coir, again, it's a waste product of coconut production as has been mentioned. It has very good properties in terms of air and water uh, content. It has a high rewetting capacity, but there are some challenges with it. Some, some materials of it need to be buffered and also it has to be sh shipped from areas such as the Philippines, India, Sri Lanka. So it has to come from a distance. Um, pine bark, it, pine bark is utilized in many countries, uh, Southern Europe, Eastern United States. It has a high air holding capacity, but it does need sometimes other materials to improve its water retention. It can be variable. And again, it has competing source use sources, such as uh, in the fuel replacement. So it, basically it, it's not just available for composting. There is other uses for it. Uh, Kevin has mentioned wood fiber. And again, this is a, a good material uh, to be used within a mix and has good uh, air holding capacity. It also is very good as part of a mix in reducing the bulk density of a compost. But again, there is competing uses for this material and that does have uh, high manufacturing costs in terms of energy. In terms of compost, composted organic wastes, again, this has been mentioned, they are high in nutrients. Um, they are very beneficial, are been shown to be beneficial in multiple instances in suppressing pathogens uh, within a growing media, but there is variability in feedstocks. They do need to be composted well to provide sufficient stability. And particularly um, in some countries, maybe Ireland is one of them, where you have uh, source separation of the feedstocks can lead to issues around plastics and other uh, contaminants coming into it. So again, that needs to be taken into account. So what we've done is we've started to review recent work that's been done in the area of heat uh, replacements and dilutants. And again, a lot of the work has already been done in Ireland on green waste compost, composted bark, coir, wood fiber, along with some other waste materials such as spent brewery grains and seafood waste. Um, so a lot of the work was done in the late 1990s, early 2000s by Muno Prasad and Michael Marr from Chagas and uh, Bordemona at the time, respectively. In one of their final publications um, that I can find from 2006 Orbit Conference, they did indicate that uh, peat mixed with either composted green waste, composted green waste with a nitrogen source or bark successfully produced high quality plants of Escalonian Hypericum. Uh, they were, the paper also reported that 100% bark composted for 12 weeks with a, a urea source did perform well, as well as the standard peat control. And I'm just including this to show that there is some work that has been done previously in Ireland that does, from a research perspective, 
give us a starting point in terms of where we will look to start uh, our work into the future. There's also some international work. Well, there's lots of international work, but one uh, recently completed study by the AHDB in the UK, um, Project CP30, what, sorry, 138, led by Barry Mulholland. They did indicate that there was nine putative mixes that they found to produce statistically similar plants, plants to a peat standard um, in nursery stock trials. Six of these nine were based on a large component or a, over 50% component of coir. The other three mixes were either bark or bark and wood fiber ratios. Um, they, the, the authors do report though that within these uh, ide idealized mixes, there was plant to plant or species to species variation in terms of plant performance. So again, uh, you, uh, and as Kevin has mentioned and, and Bart before him, you know, different plant species may react differently. So there, it's unlikely that there'd be one standard uh, replacement for peat in it, on any nursery. Um, the grow, all these trials were conducted on grower nurseries, so there was different approaches to irrigation and, and fertigation. Within that study of these nine idealized mixes, um, they had, I noticed one thing is that the AFP was in and around 15, and um, some of you may work, remember work done by Michael Marr in Chagas in 1998, and he would have said that an AFP of 15% was always a good standard mark when looking for a growth media for the nursery stock sector. So again, even though they're working here with non-peat materials, uh, kind of cer certain things such as AFP standards seem to be holding true and that that should be your target. But there may be material, there may be uh, instances or areas of use for peat that we can't replicate with currently available materials. And we may need to look at uh, more modern or newer processes. One of them, and Bart has already mentioned, is transforming waste material um, into new products. So biochar is one that Bart has mentioned, uh, and I won't go into too much, but it is something we would like to start looking at um, in Ireland uh, uh, from a research perspective. And there's also other processes such as hydrothermal carbonization, which again is a slightly different process, but can handle other wastes, slightly wetter wastes, potentially even some agricultural wastes uh, that can transform these materials into uh, into chars that are quite similar to peat in their structure. So it's something that we would like to look at. We've also um, recently started looking at the manufacturing of growth media from bio, uh, from bio resources. So looking at using biopolymers derived from natural materials, uh, plant-based fibers, to see if we can create growth media. So we had a small uh, Enterprise Ireland funded project uh, in the last year where we worked with a third level institute and we created a, a material based on polylactic acid and thermoplastic starch, which is in the bottom right there. And at the top right, you can see a, a, a microscope image of that material, and it just shows the porous nature of it. Now, these initial studies very much showed us that we need to improve the water holding capacity of these materials. But again, it is work that we have started, and we're hoping to uh, access funding in the future to continue this work. So what's Chagas's research approach? We have identified what we feel are five key areas for peat replacement and peat reduction in professional horticulture. Uh, nursery stock is one of them. We want to provide an independent assessment of peat dilutants and peat replacement materials. Uh, we want to build upon the progress achieved both in previous research nationally and internationally. We want to look at composts that are available uh, commercially. We want to build active international collaboration. I think that's really key because there is a lot of work going on at an international Northern European level on peat, peat dilutants and peat replacements. And I think we need to tap into that. We want to integrate our stakeholders from the start of projects and, and consult with them consistently through it. So again, instead of us going off doing a research project and presenting the industry with the results of it at the end, we want to really work with the industry from the start of projects and design projects that I think all stakeholders can find beneficial. We, have a, we need a dual approach. We need to assess near to market materials now that are available now while also um, beginning to do research on more longer term um, materials that may come in the future. And also I think what we've learned with, through the issue around peat is that we need to develop a range of materials uh, for the sector that are available, preferably on the island of Ireland, uh, to give growers options in, in case there is an issue. Because again, as Kevin outlined, there is a significant uh, challenge in producing enough sufficient volumes of alternative materials. So to date, we have, uh, Chagas have applied for funding, uh, for research funding for multiple national and international European funding calls. We have commenced a, a project, an internally funded Chagas project on peat alternatives that started last month. We're in discussions at the moment with other research organizations in Europe to try and build a formal grouping to share and swap research information uh, as it's developed. And this week we have uh, advertised for a permanent research officer in the area of growth media. And again, this is to appoint somebody to really 
spearhead this work into the next decade. So in conclusion, that the key for us will be finding and identifying materials which work agronomically, that are available in sufficient quality quantities, again, preferably on the island of Ireland, and are at a low cost with a favorable environmental footprint. And that obviously, that's a huge challenge and a very big ask. We want to build on previous research work, and we do feel that working internationally and collaboratively will be the key to this. Uh, and what is evident is that while research may identify potential materials, it will be the skill and professionalism of growers and grow media manufacturers that will really drive the adoption of this. So again, we as a research organization can help to identify materials and evaluate them, but ultimately it'll be the skill of growers and growth media, growth media manufacturers that will lead to successful adoption on nursery. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, if there's any questions from the auditorium, we'll take them, please. Yeah, go ahead. So the question is uh, from the seaweed producer's side, is there a byproduct that can be used as an ingredient or an alternative? Um, from my understanding is that the, by, the level of byproduct in seaweed stimulant manufacture can be quite low depending on the process. So some of the processes are similar to cold pressing of um, oil, uh, olive oil, and you will have a fibrous element that's left. Some of them are, it's a complete digestion. So it's digested almost in a salt. So there's a very little solid matter that's actually remaining. Uh, without having analyzed the material, I think from even from cold breast material, there may be um, high levels of salt, which again, if it's a small fraction of 1%, half a percent, 2%, that kind of constituent in the growth media, I don't see it being an issue. Uh, any higher levels then the, the amount of EC in the product might be an issue. Uh, but again, we, we haven't done any testing on it, but that's just uh, a comment on it. We have one more question there in the center. You go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. Um, the first one really is just to make a comment and I guess it's in your opinion on it. Are we really facing some of the nurseries that we need to do that different products that they're growing may require different nutrients? So you can spoil it up to date if you can have one medium that is just amazing. I'm just going to repeat that question for the benefit of our online viewers. You know, uh, is there going to be a different product for different crops? in this sector? I think that's quite likely. I think uh, just based solely, we haven't done a lot of work at, to date yet on it, but based on what's been published in the research, there is varying plant responses. So yeah, some plants like Grisolinia and stuff have performed very well in alternative gro growth media. Some such as Viburnum in the recent UK study performed less well and was less consistent across the different media. So I think whether we're going to uh, recommend different specific materials in each grow, we'll definitely probably um, recommend different types of blends. I think that that is quite likely. And your second question? Yeah, um, it was just uh, going back to the slide where you looked at the, I think it was the biological chicken you were measuring the species um, shrinkage and the nutrients. Well, it, it measures the. So, so it, the question is in refer to the biological stability uh, slide. Um, what that measures is the microbiological activity. So, sorry, what was the question, Joe? Um, yeah, so uh, I think ultimately, like, was it just the biological activity that you're measuring? Because if we were to start using maybe citric organic sources of nutrients in the future, it's obviously going to get into a relationship with microbial, with microbiome inside of the media or not. That that measure then, is that going to relate something to like stability of your like, porosity, which makes it more fragile? You know, that's what I'm trying to comment on. It could be microbial, rich, but, um, but still quite stable in terms of physical characteristics. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying. So what you're saying is like traditionally we have looked for materials that are microbiologically less active because they retain their volume and that was seen as a benefit. Um, as we transition into other materials, they are going to be more microbiologically active. We know that. So we have to find a balance between um, a reduction in volume in the pot. Um, and again, that's important as well, because a reduction in volume in pot obviously drives air out of the root system, and that will negatively impact growth. Also, from a very practical point of view, pots that are half full have been shown in studies to be less preferable to the consumer. 
So pots that are half full versus pots that are full of growing media have been shown in studies to be passed over by the consumer. So we know that the consumer doesn't like that look. Um, in terms of that method of analysis, yes, we're going to have to take into account that we're going to be using. So that method uses, uh, what it does is it provides a nutrient source to any microbiology within the physical sample. And then they, that microbiology begins to multiply. And as it multiplies, it consumes oxygen. And it's that pressure differential that that measures. So again, going back to research challenges, that is a method that is quite well suited to measuring very stable materials. And we may have to come up with new methods for measuring the stability of compost that possibly uh, are done in a different way. So yeah, I agree. We, we have to look at the methods that we do to evaluate these materials. Okay, we have another question up the back. So, so the question is, is there the pr prospect of So I'm just going to repeat the question for the audience online. So the question is, is there a potential to incorporate animal manures, animal bedding uh, uh, products from the, agri the, the mainstream agricultural sector into growth media? Um, I think the challenge initially will be that those materials will inherently have very high EC levels. I think for any kind of food production area, there would be a risk, a potential risk or a concern around pathogen transfer. Um, I do think that there's the potential maybe to use them uh, as an initial feedstock for some form of a transformation process, be it uh, thermal transformation. Um, so I can see them in that case, or even potentially as a feedstock for fibers into the manufacture of growing material. I think as a, a raw replacement into a compost, I can see them being very challenging materials to work with. But So I do think there are materials that may require a transformation step, but um, we don't live in a bubble. Like the world, the agricultural world is moving forward. They're looking at processes such as anaerobic digestion and other forms of ways of managing those kind of wastes. And it, it is possible that we could capitalize on some of the downstream waste products that come from the processing of those agricultural wastes. Okay, if there's no more in the auditorium, any more questions? No, okay, we move to the online questions. Uh, there's a question there. Uh, how does, why is green compost more reliable in Germany than Ireland? Uh, we'll see if uh, Bart yeah. can come back to that. Bart is online still, he may come to that. Okay, and uh, can you please repeat the question? Uh, the question is, why is green compost more reliable in Germany than Ireland? Uh, well, I, I do not live in Germany, so I, I cannot say. Uh, uh, I can talk about uh, the, the Flemish compost quality. So it's it's quite um, strictly organized um, that that your compost should uh, have a, a certain stability and um, contaminant levels between certain levels. But that does not um, mean that each compost is very well suited to be used in high percentages in growing media. So we really see that uh, for Flemish composts, we have like two groups, uh, depending on the feedstock materials. The, so the more woody materials you have in growing media and, and composts uh, and, and the initial material of composting, the better is the, the compost quality for using growing media. So yeah, it's, it's, it's important to have the, a good batch of compost for using growing media. Otherwise you have problems with too high EC levels and things like that. Yeah, thank you, Bart. Michael is going to come in there. Sorry, just to clarify, that, that, that slide was in relation to the principle of having good, uh, stable green waste compost in a mix. It wasn't a comment on the Irish, uh, on the level of Irish compost versus international. So I just want to clarify that. I'm not saying that Irish green waste compost is poor by any standards. I was trying to make the point that it is essential that you have a well composted material if you're going to incorporate it into a green, uh, into a growing media mix. I'm just going to bring Kevin in here. No, it, it may also have referred to something I had said because I said the quality of green green waste compost that we have in Germany is very high. 
Um, I personally, I think it goes back to the consumer who's putting the green waste and perhaps Dean can also comment on the UK situation. But um, for instance, things like Roundup, like so if Irish consumers are not educated to exclude stuff that you've sprayed Roundup on from your green waste, because although it's supposed to disappear after a while, um, like there's still we're still detecting DDT in, in in stuff that we've tested. So there are these forever chemicals. And also just from parks, uh, green waste that's collected there, often it's contaminated with glass and needles and dog waste. So that's the sort of thing that, that I, I certainly was referring to. So if, if the consumer is educated, we can bring up the quality of green waste in Ireland. And it wasn't directed at anyone who's producing green waste here. It was just uh, going back to the source material. Okay, thank you. I think that's all the questions. Okay, so we'll take a break now for 20 minutes. We'll be back here at 11.30 sharp. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks very much for uh, sticking with us. So our second session is just about to start now, and we're going to invite our two speakers from uh, the Department of Agriculture, and they'll be followed up by um, a recording of Andreas Freda. So I suppose it's a little bit of looking into the future on the, the pest risk analysis from the Department of Agriculture, and then we will look at some of the technical research that's uh, being done in Germany. So I'm just going to ask um, our speakers, uh, Connor and Andy from the department to join me now. So just to introduce, we have um, Connor McGee and Andy Burke from the Department of Agriculture. They're going to be uh, sharing the presentation between them. Just to introduce them, Connor McGee was recently appointed to manage the Plant Sciences Division Pest Risk Analysis Unit. He originally started in the Department of Agriculture as an ectotoxicologist in the Pesticides Registration Division before moving to the efficacy unit, mainly working with biocidal products and authorization. And prior to this, he worked in Monaghan Mushroom Research Unit and develop, uh, sorry, Research and Development Division. And before that was a researcher in UCD and Chagas. And his research specializing in soil ecology and growing media. And Andy Burke then is uh, an assistant agriculture inspector in DAFM in the area of pest risk analysis. And he's worked with the Department of Agriculture since 2017, first in laboratory roles in the area of plant health before moving to pest risk analysis. Prior to this, he worked for six years in Jagas Oak Park Potato Breeding Program, and his studies were in plant science and bioinformatics. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Donald, and thank you everyone for having us here today. It's a pleasure to actually physically address the community again. So we're aware that many of you were probably present when uh, Melanie Tuffin presented her DAFM funded horizon scanning and pest risk assessment research on pesticide spruce back in 2019. Well, since then, there have been considerable developments in the in-house capacity for pest risk analysis in DAFM. And today it's our purpose to bring you up to speed with that and indeed the developments in the wider Plant Sciences Division Laboratory. So representing the Plant Sciences Division Laboratory staff today are myself and Andy, who are the two members of the Pest Risk Analysis Unit. Don't let's introduce us, so I won't go into that much more. We have three main purposes today, and that is to introduce the expanded Plant Sciences Division Laboratory, its staff and the services it provides. Secondly, we'll present the newly formed Pest Risk Analysis Unit and just briefly cover pest risk analysis uh, and give you some idea of what's involved in the process. And finally, I'll hand over to Andy, who's going to give you a flavor of the pests that have come to our attention and our horizon scanning and pest risk assessment activities to date. So firstly, the Plant Sciences Division. This is a relatively new division uh, by Daphne standards. It came from very humble beginnings, but has expanded over the years. And particularly in the recent two to three years, there have been a number of appointments for key specialists in key areas to increase the uh, services it provides and the expertise it has in-house. These have been experts appointed in fungi pneumocytes, bacteriology, insects and mites, nematology, honeybee health, viruses, molecular diagnostics, and pest risk analysis. Uh, these appointments were particularly needed as in Europe, there are hundreds of regulated pests. These include quarantine pests, priority pests, uh, regulated non-quarantine pests, and as well as the Irish protected zone pests, which we mentioned today. 
Should any of these pests be suspected of being present on commodities that have been inspected by the Forestry Services or HPHD, uh, when these are submitted to the laboratories, our staff must be capable of accurately diagnosing if any of these pests are present on the commodities and relaying the findings to the inspectorate. Um, this is quite challenging as these pests, the list of the, uh, the annexes, the regulation which lists which pests are quarantine or non-quarantine pests is always changing. It involves keeping up to date with uh, new diagnostic techniques and up to date with the science. So there's a quite a lot of pressure in the laboratories to be able to provide these expertise. Uh, to give you some idea how busy the laboratories are, well, in 2020, they received about 700 samples to back Weston. However, many of these samples are analyzed for multiple pests, so that actually translates into about 2,500 tests per year. Uh, 700 samples is actually quite low, and this is due to COVID and a range of other factors. Typically, they'd receive about 900 samples, but the demand on the laboratories is growing. And when I was developing this presentation back in early October, it already received 1,250 samples at that point. So you see the demands on the laboratory services is particularly needed, and that was a reason for the appointment of a lot of these new specialists to be able to provide that expertise and services to the inspectorate. In addition to the samples we analyze in-house, we coordinate the analysis by two and a half thousand analysis with the court laboratories for a number of pests. So here are some of the pests that we conduct uh, assessments for in-house. Uh, the pests, the three on the bottom are the ones that are analyzed in cork. These are Winnie Amelora, so fire blight, Alstonia and Clavobacterum potato, and beet necrotic yellow vein virus. The rest of the pests are assessed in-house in back west. And, um, these are mainly for the annual surveys and multi-annual surveys that are conducted for pests that are present to determine if these pests are present in Ireland in compliance with the regulations. Uh, typically, the laboratories are at its busiest around this time of the year. Between the end of July and early November, they receive the majority of their samples from the annual surveys. And so they're under a lot of pressure this time of the year and generally throughout the rest of the year is when they're developing further expertise and improving diagnostic tests and the expertise they can provide to the, uh, to the inspectorate. So that's a snapshot of the laboratories. I just wanted to give you an overview of what the division we are actually a part of. Uh, so secondly, pest risk analysis. Well, the PRU is a part of the laboratories that so we provide services and uh, support to the forestry service and HPHD. We were created in 2020. And the rest rationale behind the creation of the unit was that in the plant health and biosecurity strategy, risk analysis was identified as integral to protecting the Irish agri-economy and environment. We have three main purposes, and that is to perform horizon scanning, undertake risk assessment on plant pests and trade pathways, and provide support on requests for plant health related issues. Essentially, what that boils down to is it is our role to identify emerging pest threats from around the world, evaluate the level of threat they pose to Irish biosecurity, and make recommendations for how best keep them out. Now, we do undertake the evaluation of these pest threats, and we provide our recommendations to the risk managers and forestry services and HPHD make the final call on the recommendations we make for these pests and trade pathways. So PRA, from a, there is a legislative basis for PRA pest risk assessment. It's under international trade laws, phytosanitary measures against trade must be technically justified. And the EU regulation 2016-2031 outlines the criteria for which pests must meet to be uh, regulated by phytosanitary measures. And generally the pest risk assessment report is the accepted mess of, uh, method to justify the regulation of these pests and pathways. And Ireland does utilize phytosanitary measures on trade to a relatively high degree compared to our EU member states. We currently have 23 protected member zones, uh, we currently have 23 uh, protected zones uh, in this country. These protected zones exist to prevent the introduction of pests which are already present in Europe and had devastating effects in Europe from entering and establishing in Ireland and having similar effects on our agri economy. So that's just a brief overview of the rationale of the pest risk analysis unit in the labs. I'm now going to hand over to Andy, who's going to go into the pest risk analysis process in a bit more detail and just cover some of the pests that have come to our attention. Andy. Great. Thanks, Connor. So in Ireland, we've had recent introductions of plant pests. Um, several of them are listed here. They've become established here. Uh, the most notable being Phytophthora morum and Ash dieback, both which have had devastating impacts on plant health in this country. And the number of threats on the horizon is growing, and this is due to globalization and trade, and the growing number, um, the growing volumes in trade in plants and plant products. And this is where pest risk analysis has a role to play. 
So a number of these threats on the horizon yet to arrive in Ireland. They uh, they're, are regulated at EU level. This based on prior pest risk analysis. And because they're regulated, this reduces the risk of their introduction. In DAFM, we survey for these pests, uh, we test for them, and we monitor closely the evolving threat that these regulated pests pose. So for example, Zyella fadasiosa, there's been several findings this year in Europe, uh, including findings in a Portuguese nursery uh, on rosemary plants which several countries linked to those findings uh, in Europe from the onward trade. And then among our protected zone pests, Ips typographus is a bark beetle. Uh, there's been additional breeding populations found in Kent, England this summer. And as a result, the demarcated area, the area under control in the southeast of England has recently increased in size. Among the EU emergency plant pests, tomato brown rugose fruit virus. This continues to spread. Uh, in 2021, it's been recorded uh, in nine additional European countries for the first time. And then among the EU priority pests, Agrilis planipennis, emerald ash borer, and Anaphophora glabripennis, the Asian longhorn beetle. These continue to be found in new areas. And as a result, they undergo costly and um, time-consuming eradication uh, measures, and in some cases, containment measures. In the pest risk analysis unit, we're particularly interested in non-regulated pests, uh, pests that have yet to arrive and in which there is a pathway, a potential pathway of entry into Ireland. We identify these through horizon scanning. So what exactly do we mean by horizon scanning? We continuously monitor a range of sources to identify emerging plant pest threats. These sources include scientific literature, trade journals, media, and then by participation in expert working groups, such as the EFSA working group on horizon scanning. And there's three key things that we're interested in. So new species, so pests that are new to science, uh, or species that are acting as pests for the first time. And I have a couple of examples of these in, in the next, um, in the following slides. Uh, we're also interested in reports of pests spreading to new locations, uh, particularly spreading to locations that are climatically similar to Ireland. And again, I have a few examples of this coming up. And we're also interested in, in pests being recorded on new hosts for the first time. And um, again, hosts that are in part Ireland or that are traded in Ireland. And pests can, when they move to new locations, be recorded on a new host for the first time. And uh, we would have seen that here in this country on Phytophthora remor. So I'm going to outline a couple of these non-regulated emerging plant pests uh, relevant for this seminar, I hope. And in all these, all the cases, um, we monitor these. And uh, in some cases, we performed rapid pest risk analysis, the next step after horizon scanning, if, if we identify that the, the, the threat warrants pest risk analysis. So the first one is Heliomorpha phales, the brown marimated stink bug. So this is a polyphagous pest. Uh, it affects fruit, field vegetables, and ornamentals. And this summer, uh, there was an adult found in a furmone trap in Surrey, England. This follows Last year, when there was two adults found in traps, yet the, the evidence would suggest that it's, it's not yet established in England. Uh, there's no breeding populations discovered yet. And then from a, a pest risk analysis point of view, so there's been a lot of research on this pest species. Um, the climatic modeling and the observational data to date would suggest that this species in climates uh, such as in Ireland would be unable to complete a generation and therefore establish if it remained outdoors. And then evidence would also suggest that this species needs a number of generations per year in order to be particularly damaging. Then we also look at threats from, uh, from the host point of view. Um, so for example, beach, uh, there's a foliar nematode, Lodinticus crenatae, 
uh, which is now recognized as the likely cause for beech leaf disease, BLD, which is rapidly spreading across North America um, and is, is damaging beech. And given the threat that this pest poses, DAFM now survey for this pest. Another pest on beech uh, that we are monitoring is Petractia leobe. And this is an emerging fungal pathogen. So this is an example of a new species. Uh, it's found in Central Europe. There's uncertainty over its uh, current distribution and its impacts. Um, it's, it's not known if the recent damage reported in Europe is due to climate change or other factors, or if it is a new uh, introduced invasive species in Europe. And there's, there's uncertainty over the extent of impacts. However, the, the necrosis it causes on the leaves could reduce uh, tree health and uh, visual appeal. And on apples then, Diplodia bulgarica is an emerging fungal pathogen, another fungal pathogen that can cause canker on apples. And there has been new findings in Western Germany um, in areas that would indicate that Ireland's climate would be uh, suitable as indicated in our analysis here on the right. And this is the type of new findings in new locations that we are interested in, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Ignigma diprosis agapanti, agapantus galmage. Uh, this is another example of a new species. So this was uh, new to science, described in 2016. It's believed to be native to South Africa. That's where Agapanthus, its host plant, is native. And as with most gall midges, it's very host specific. It, uh, it's, it's only known to affect uh, Agapanthus genus. And as an introduced species in England, it's become very widespread in southern areas. And I suppose of note is a uh, report of an overwintering population as far north as Yorkshire. So this would indicate that Ireland's climate is suitable and that anywhere that Agapanthus is grown in Ireland would be uh, at risk. And the RHS this year, they're reporting a significant uptick in reports and findings this year compared to last year. And the next one, Furnasporia acrylegi colia, is a downy mildew. Uh, this was reported in the UK in 2013. Um, this one, it, it's, uh, this pathogen is believed to have originated from uh, China or South Korea, where this species doesn't behave as a pest. And it's since spread rapidly in the UK, affecting acrylegia species and all their hybrids. And uh, it's been in the news recently uh, due to findings in Germany, including on commercial premises and, and nurseries where it's undergone eradication measures, even though it's unregulated. Um, so uh, because it's not widespread in the EU, it does meet the criteria of a potential uh, regulation at EU level. And then uh, one more very recent uh, emerging plant pest threat uh, located close to us is Phytophthora pluvillus. Uh, so the Forestry Commission in the UK um, notified about finding of this uh, pathogen uh, on the 20th of October, a couple of weeks ago. It was found on mature woodland in Cornwall on uh, Douglas fir and Western hemlock. And Western hemlock is actually a new host for this. Phytophthora, but this, uh, this Phytophthora pluvillus, uh, this is the first report in Europe, and it is known to occur also in New Zealand, where it affects pine, and it causes red needle cast on pines there. Uh, it was originally uh, reported and found in the Pacific Northwest in America in uh, 2013. So in, in summary, uh, in this presentation, we have introduced the plant science division. Who perform, and we've outlined how we perform our PRA and diagnostic work. And we do this in conjunction with uh, the border inspectors of DAFM and uh, with the regional plant health inspectors of HP, HD, and DAFM. And specifically, we've introduced uh, the, the new pest risk analysis unit in DAFM um, and how the PRAU, one of our key goals is to identify 
and highlight emerging plant pest threats. And we do this to prevent their introduction, uh, to reduce the risk of their introduction, and to facilitate preparedness uh, for these pests. So for the pests that the PRA, PRAU identify whose introduction could be mitigated against through uh, exclusion or regulation, um, as Connor uh, outlined earlier, we'll make specific recommendations to the risk managers. Uh, some pests will arrive through uh, difficult to reg uh, regulate channels, uh, such as hitchhiking or natural dispersion, and some may not be able to uh, presently establish in our climate. But all that is explored in detail in the pest risk analysis process. So thank you very much. That's great. Thanks very much. I'll just uh, stop sharing the screen here and we'll see if we have any questions. So just want, is there any questions from the audience here before we go to online? No, okay. Uh, there's, there's one here. There's a lot of Icopanthus in South and Southwest in gardens and estates. What are the symptoms of gall midge damage? Yeah, so it's um, it affects the buds, deformed buds, uh, discoloration in the buds. Uh, so that's where the larvae live, and um, it, it, the symptoms can vary from mild to severe. Um, so it's if if you peel back any discolored buds, uh, you may see yellow larvae inside, um, and if the if the infection if, if the attack occurs early on in the season. Uh, it can get into the developing flower spike and it may just result in complete uh, collapse of the flower head. Um, in, um, if, if the infection occurs a bit later and the buds are developing, it may affect so many buds that it, it, you get complete flower failure as well. But in, it's very variable from year to year and in the, in the levels of damage as well. Um, I think the advice from the RHS is uh, it, it's very difficult to eradicate, so just remove the deformed. This is for the the the, the, uh, con the consumer, or the customer in their garden, just to remove the 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 deformed buds. Uh, you you may, you may still get an adequate display of flowers, but it's very difficult to eradicate uh, because it affects the buds. It's probably more difficult to see in the trade, but it has been seen in the trade in the UK. Um, you know, particularly at, at I suppose at the point of sales and and you know where the display of flowers is 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 needed. Okay, okay, thanks very much. So it's not a, a pest scene in Ireland yet, but it's certainly something on the horizon, as you say. Yeah, um, there. Yeah, I think there there, there may be a, a suspect case, but I, I I'm not sure if that hasn't been confirmed yet. So okay, yeah, I can I can understand that. And uh, maybe a question then for Connor and yourself. Um, our nearest neighbour, GB, isn't is now a third country, and how does that impact PRAs and the pests that we are exposed to, or does it does it have any impact at all? Well, we're keeping close contact with the Pest Risk Analysis Unit in the UK to keep up to date with the updates. Obviously, the departure from the EU means no longer at the European meetings, which we would attend. So keeping track of updates in the UK has become a bit more problematic. And we have seen recently they've launched a service where they're reporting the interceptions and they came across it the other week. Um, so that is in the public domain now as well for other actors who wish to keep up to date with their developments there. In terms of the impacts on the laboratories on a wider scale, yes, we saw there's greater samples coming in to laboratories this year, and that will be because the UK is a third country now. There's more inspections of the products that have been committed traded between Ireland and UK, and so there will be impacts there. But in terms of pest risk analysis, there's still a free flow of information. We're in open discussion of what's happening here and they're in discussion with us what's happening there. And there shouldn't be any enhanced threats from lack of knowledge transfer, I would say. Oh, okay. Thanks very much. So it's, it's status as a, as a non-European partner it doesn't really have a great impact in, in terms of your collaboration and, and risk analysis. Essentially, it shouldn't, no. Um, okay. Obviously, the regulations that are changing in the UK, the industry are well aware of that, are impacting other elements of trade in Ireland and the UK and having knock-on consequences, but that's a separate matter. So there's 
but for our for our purposes it's pretty much still straightforward in terms of communication okay Andy and Connor, thanks very much for, for joining us and explaining about some of the activities in, in uh, your department in the Department of Agriculture. So thanks very much. I'll just get ready now to move on to our final speaker, Andreas Breda. So this is a recording of uh, his presentation given during the week. Just to introduce Andreas before I tee up his video, uh, Dr. Andreas uh, Vreda is Head of Horticulture Testing in the Chamber of Agriculture in Schleswig-Holstein. He has worked there since 2003. Uh, prior to working with LKSH, he has been a soil scientist and a landscape gardener. He completed his PhD in the University of Hanover. And I was lucky enough to visit the LKSH site with some Irish nurserymen uh, about two or three years ago. And it's a, it's a tremendous site with a lot of activity going on there. So um, we'll, we'll get plenty of information from Andrea. So I'll just set this up now. Yeah, it's a great pleasure for me to um, give that talk to you today. Um, of course, in my, uh, I'm especially nervous at the moment and today because I'm not a native speaker. Um, I rarely have to speak English nowadays, and my English teacher, when I was in school long, long time ago, was often very unhappy with my English, but I will try. Already in advance, sorry for my bad English, but um, let's, let's try, and I hope you will understand what I, what I see. Um, the problem might be my German pronunciation, that might be a problem, but let's start. Okay, I will talk about results of some recent completed research in our experimental station. You see it on the left side. Um, the structure of my talk is who am I? What do I do? And where the hell is the small village Ellerhof? Um, regulations for peat reduction in growing media in horticulture in tree nurseries in Germany. It's a very important fact here in Germany results with different peat substitutes in the culture of woolly plants in pots and containers. It's one of the focus uh, in my talk. Um, organic fertilization compared to mineral fertilization, uh, coated fertilizer that are very common in uh, use in Germany in container grown woolly plants. Variety uh, differences in sherry laurel with respect to the leaf damage caused by sodium in the irrigation water. And if there is time less, I will give you some findings uh, on the topic climate change in trees ranges of the future for urban sites, but only if there is time left. Okay, that's me, my age is 58. Um, I'm a PhD um, and I work at the Chamber of Agriculture in Schleswig-Holstein um, and uh, yeah, we, we, we tell it LKSH in the department, department of Horticulture and that is located in the small village in Ellerhope. I will show you later where it is. I'm the senior of the experimental station for horticulture here in Ellerhope, and I have been working here since October 2003. I'm a trained gardener, so I've learned it, and I also worked as a gardener for many years in a landscape garden, uh, as a landscape and also in tree, different tree nurseries. But later I start to study and horticulture, and I received a PhD uh, in horticulture at the University of Hanover. And before I uh, come to the LKSH, uh, I worked in a soil testing laboratory before moving to LKSH, getting senior experimental of this experimental station. Okay, Ella Hope is located uh, northwest of Hamburg. You see it here. This is a small village of uh, Ella Hope. And you see here, this is the district Pinneberg, the Pinneberg, um, yeah, Christ Pinneberg, we, we tell it in Germany. It's a, uh, yeah, you see these are the, the red lines of the borders of the uh, district Pinneberg. And it is uh, directly 
at the border of uh, Hamburg. Um, it is the second largest closed nursery area in Germany. And as you see here, uh, we have 20, nearly 300 nurseries with, uh, three, uh, with 3,500 hectares of production area. Uh, and we are one of the largest closed nursery areas or sites in uh, the world with over 200 years of tradition. And you see um, that the horticultural center where I work was located in the heart of the Pinneberg district here in Ellerhoek. Uh, so we are, yes, uh, uh, the, the central, very central in the Pinneberg district. Okay, that's to Ellerhope, to my experimental station. Uh, the second topic is the regulation for peat reduction in Germany. It is very, very discussed, discussed very critically from the growers in Germany because the government wants to reduce and to ban the use of peat in uh, horticulture, especially in horticulture. You see, this is a, re a site for the peat cutting. Um, and when we discuss about peat reduction, we have to look at the uh, properties of an ideal growing media for horticulture. And the physical properties for an ideal growing media for horticulture must be that it says the structure was good and has a high structure stability. The volume weight has to be low. The pore volume must be high. The air and also the water capacity must be high. And the revitability must also be good. The chemical properties may be the pH value, which must be low. The salt content must be also low. The nutrient content must be low to fertilize it as the, uh, the, the plants want. And the buffering capacity must be high as possible. The biological properties uh, must be no pathogens, uh, no pests. Uh, the microbiological activity must be low and there must be no or no weeds and or wheat seeds in the substrate, in the ideal substrate media. Other properties, uh, sustainability must be high of the product of the, the growing media. The environmental uh, compatibility must be good or high. The availability must, must be assured, every time assured. Quality stability must be high. The shelf life must be good. The cultivation risk for the grower must be low as possible and the price must be also low. So these are the properties of an ideal growing media, but there isn't any growing media which fulfills all these properties I show you here. But peat fulfills most of these requirements for an ideal growing media. That is very uh, important. From the point of view of the production technology, the only thing that is usually criticized is the, uh, uh, its low buffering capaci capacity and, and the poor availability of, the, of peat. Nothing else was criticized. And the properties of compost, wood fiber, cocoa fibers, or cocoa peat, on the other hand, deviate from, this, uh, from the requirements of an ideal growing media in many more points compared to, uh, to peat. Okay. The German government peat reduction strategy and the, in particular the possibility peat ban are therefore viewed rather skeptically by most players in the horticultural sector in Germany. It may be the same as in Ireland. Uh, why should the horticulture save peat in the future? Why the government looks at the horticultural sector? That's a question for all and also for me and for the growers here in Germany. Um, also peatland soils make up only about 3% of the world's land surface. They store about 400, uh, 450 to 500 gigatons. One gigaton is 1 billion ton of carbon in form of peat. This is about one third of the carbon stored in soils worldwide, but it's only 3% of the soils 
soil surface. So they store a, a big amounts of carbon, the peatlands. Approximately 560 gigatons of carbon is currently stored in all land plants combined com globally. So you can see all plants uh, globally uh, stored only a little bit more carbon compared to 3% of the land surface. It is estimated that growing peatland, more lands, stored about 150 to 250 million tons of carbon annually as peat. But this just offsets their simultaneously methane uh, emission, not more. Methane, or methane, sorry for my bad pronunciation, is also a climate damaging gas with, which, uh, with at least a stronger short term effect on the climatic change than CO2, than carbon. Okay. Only 1% of peatland in Germany is used for peat cutting. This is very important. And you see on the right side, most peatland is used for grassland, for cows, for crop farming, 80%, and forestry, 17%. But no one in Germany talks about agriculture about the farmer, because their lobby is very strong, very, very strong, much, much more, much stronger than the very, very small lobby of horticulture. That is a problem in Germany. So the government only looks at the, to, to the horticulture to reduce the peat. In Germany, there is a climate protection program 2030, of the government, of the old government in Germany. We are getting a new one in several days, maybe in December. Um, and um, this climate protection program is particularly important for horticulture because the peat reduction strategy is part of this climate protection program of 2030. And um, the peat reduction strategy is the policy, the policy calls for, in the peat reduction strategy, sorry, the policy, policy calls for peat cutting in Germany to be stopped in long term. Hopefully long term is very long. No one knows it correctly what long term means at the moment. For hobby horticulture, for the consumers, potting soils are to be peat free by 2026. This is only five years or four years, but no problem so far for the um, commercial horticultural sector. But for this sector, for the commercial horticulture sector, the aim is not to ban peat completely, but to replace it as far as possible uh, by 2029. What, what means as far as possible? We try to discuss it with the government and to to give them not more than 70% or 60%, but this is a discussion with open end. It may be that as far as possible means 80%, maybe more, hopefully less for the horticultural sector. The Central Horticultural Association uh, in Germany is currently offering the German government the opportunity, uh, the opportunity to replace 50% of peak in growing media by 2025. That is very, very much. And 70% of peak by 2030. But this is only the Central Horticultural Association. The ZVG, that, that it is a, um, we call it uh, ZVG in Germany, speaks for all branches of horticulture, here especially for flower and ornamental plant growers, the floricultural sector with the blooming flowers, but not for the ornamental woody plant growers, which mostly grows their plants in greenhouses, these ornamental plant growers or the floricultural sector in greenhouses. The ZVG does not speak for the association of German tree nurseries or German tree nursery growers, BDB, whose members mainly cultivate in open air, not protected for the weather, from the weather that is very important to, to 
to look at it in the, in the discussion here. Cultivation is mostly not in greenhouses. It is in larger containers and which much longer cultivation times. It takes up to uh, two growing season with the same gro uh, uh, growing uh, substrate or growing medium uh, in, in the containers in tree nurseries. And the demands on the, the, the demands on the physical properties of the growing media, high air capacity, high structural stability, good drainage, uh, are therefore much higher in tree nurseries compared to the floricultural sector. However, the physical properties in particular often get worse with increasing pro proportions of peat substitutes in growing media. So that is a problem for the uh, tree nursery growers. Therefore, the BDB assumes that the peat content in growing media for tree nurseries of not more 50% will not be possible by 2025. So we can't reduce it more than 50%. And we are sure, we discussed it a few days ago, that uh, we are sure that we can't, overall, tree nursery growers in, uh, in Germany, we can't uh, reduce peats more than 70% at the moment. So, but we have, we will see, we can't uh, give them the government uh, for, uh, uh, that we can say 50%, we can, 50, can reduce 50% peat. And the BDB believes that the results of the scientific projects on peat reduction and peat substitution in tree nurseries must first be awaited before binding decisions on peat substitution can be made at the moment. And the, the scientific projects are running. Currently, the BDB considers a maximum peat content of 70% is for realistic. It means 30% peat substitution by 2025, but not really 50%. We are not able to do it. The target of 70% um, peat substitution in 2030 does not seem achievable at present for the tree nursery growers. First, we have to wait for the results from the trials and from the nurseries themselves. And later, if we have the results, we can uh, discuss it uh, uh, again, how, can, how much peat we can substitute realistic in three nurseries. But what the new federal government will really decide now is still completely open, especially since the Green Party will now also be the part of the federal government. And so uh, I think it will get more prob problematically for the tree nursery growers and also for the horticultural sector in, in, in some. Okay. Now I will you show some uh, results with uh, peat substitute in rural media for trees and shrubs. And first, um, peat substitutes with the potential to replace peat in larger amounts. These five peat substitutes I will show you uh, uh, are having the best potential for replacing peat in larger portion, proportions in, uh, in Germany. It is uh, cocoa peat. This is bark humus, compost from green waste, wood fibers, and coconut fibers. Um, bark humus is composted conifer bark, most uh, um, Pisea bark. Um, and uh, the composted green waste is composted waste from the maintenance and the pruning of woody plants from streets, parks, and gardens. Um, this is the highest uh, or is the best uh, best um, yeah is best for for the use in uh, the horticultural growing media. We call it substrate. I think you understand when I will uh, say substrate for growing media. The replacement the replacement of twenty to thirty percent peat in the tree nursery growing media mostly works well. With these five uh, substitutes I have shown. If they are always from good quality, it is also in, especially the case for composted um, uh, green waste, always available in sufficient quantities. 
COVID-19 shows us, 19 shows us that there are some difficulties in, uh, in the availability of the uh, yeah, growing media comp compounds. The price is always good. Bark humus um, in Germany, the use of bark humus is also in, uh, for energy production. So the amount of uh, bark humus will be reduced. Uh, at the moment, the socioeconomic evaluation is good. That's the question for COCOS. This is very critical discussion in Germany at the moment. And their impact on climate change is low. Uh, good CO2 for footprint is necessary, e.g. the log logistics for, co uh, for COCOS or the production of wood fiber is uh, critical. And if you look at the CO2 footprint, um, if you produce wood fiber, you, the production is under high pressure and uh, high temperatures, and this is very energy consuming. Um, these are the reasons why in Germany, wood fiber and also compost from green waste are likely to be the most successful under these conditions. Also, also the cocoa peat could replace peat best because of its almost ideal properties um, nearly compared to the properties are nearly compared to uh, peat, uh, as any as many experiments has always shown that uh, that it works very good the cocoa peat. But the socio-economical evaluation, the discussion in Germany is running and is very intensive and negatively. But we must show. I can't think about peat reduction without cocoa peat. So the future will show. Yes, I will show you some results from experiments with green waste compost we have done. Um, this is a photo from the experimental site uh, from the bird's view, I view with, we have done with a, a drone, with a small drone. Um, on the left side, you see um, two year occidentalis smaragd, emerald green cedar, uh, here you see three rows of um, Rosa, Rosengräfi Mariette uh, in four liter container. This is um, Ligustrum ovalifolium aureum, golden uh, privet. And this is um, Pronus laurocerasus novita, uh, cherry laurels in five liter containers. So Tuya is grown in three liter containers, Rosa in four liter containers, and uh, Ligustrum and also Prunos in five liter containers in this uh, experiment. These are the treatments. We have 100% uh, peat, 0% uh, no, uh, compost. We have 20% compost and 80% peat, 30% compost and 70% peat, 40% compost and 60% peat, and uh, we have one to one, five, fifty percent compost and fifty percent peat. These are the treatments in our experiment. So we look at uh, increasing compost contents. And the fertilization was four kilogram per cubic meter Osmocoto exact standard, a very common fertilizer for the tree nursery growers in Germany. And because we put it uh, before the middle of uh, April, we use a eight to nine m fertilizer. And we mixed also Micromax Premium 150 gram per cubic meter. It's a trace element fertilizer. We mixed it in the growing media before potting the, fertiliz the fertilizers. And we put pot uh, at 7th and 8th, uh, 6th and 7th April 2020. And we have uh, four replications, uh, three replications each. Uh, each with, plant, uh, with 20 plants. This is a photo of the beginning of May of this uh, trial. Uh, you see uh, the two years in the foreground, the roses. Um, these are the ligusta, and uh, here are the cherry laurels. If you look at um, experiments in Germany, you always have to look at the weather, especially at the amount of precip precipitation. And you see the dark green columns are the sum, the monthly sum of pers precipitation in uh, Ellerhof. 
and this is 2020, and this is uh, 2019, the uh, light green columns. And um, as you see, the growing season begins here and ends, it depends from the weather uh, in October. And you see in 2020, the dark green columns are always uh, completely under the 30, um, 30 years average of person precipitation in Elope, the black line. And um, it was a rather dry growing season in 2020. And this, this means which did not make high amounts on the drainage of the substrate. So air, the air in the substrate plays not the rule as in wetter uh, uh, growing season. 2021 was very wet in uh, uh, Germany, but these are results from 2020 with a rather dry growing season. Okay, the trial was finished for roses at the time of their full blooming, time of sale to the uh, consumers. This was in mid-June, very fast. And for the other three woody plants, the trial continued until the middle of October. Uh, and then they were sold normally to the garden centers and the consumers by the nursery men. During the, in the process of ev evaluation, the following, uh, the following parameters, we were measured uh, the shoot length, the shoot fresh weight and the quality grade, grading, the percentage of plants in the different quality size classes. Um, these are very important parameter, uh, especially the quality grading, because the price of the um, per plant depends on the quality of the plant. So the, the percentage of plants in the different uh, classes are very important for the growers. First results with roses. You see the pictures here, and you see this is... Um, 100% peat, this is 20% compost and 80% peat, 30% compost, 40% compost, and 50% compost. And you see the plants getting uh, shorter with increasing compost uh, amount in the growing media. And uh, you can see here uh, the blooming is um, it's stopped, and here the the blooming is still running. Uh, so the, with higher uh, compost compo uh, co uh, contents in the growing media, um, the blooming was later and the plants remained smaller. I will show you the mean fresh weight uh, and the mean shot length, shoot length of the roses depending of the compost content. And as you can see here, the dark green columns are the shot fresh weight, and the light green columns are the shoot length, the average in centimeters. And as you can see, sorry, these are the German uh, writing uh, compost, but I think you can understand it. Um, you see, with uh, increasing compost contents uh, in the growing media, um, between 100% peat to 80% peat and 20% compost, the uh, shoot fresh weight increases very, very slightly. There's really no increase. And the shoot length also increases. And uh, up to 30% compost in the growing media, uh, medium, uh, the shoot length decreases to the um, to the level of 100% peat, but the shoot fresh weight incre uh, increases. And if you um, come to 40% compost and to 50% compost, shoot fresh weight and also the shoot length, length decreases. So summarize it, shoot fresh weight and shoot length decreases after exceeding the compost content of 20 to 30% maybe because the roses were potted bare rooted and uh, the in the beginning of the uh, of the experiment there was soil stress in the growing media and that reduces uh, uh, plant growth later okay looking to the results with the sherry laurels with 
Prunus laurocerasus nobita. This is a very common plant at the moment in Germany because of its um, upright growth. You see the pictures, 100% peat, 20% compost, 30% compost, 40% compost, 50% compost. And if you see, there are hardly any differences between the plants of the different treatments. So um, according to the pictures, we can say no differences. It works completely, but let's show to the percentage of loads in the different uh, quality classes depending on the compost contents. And you see the light blue parts of the columns are the, the best plants with, um, with uh, the percentage of plants in the quality class 80 to 100 centimeter was 5% in 100% peat. And there were no plants in the other treatments with uh, increasing compost contents. And the second best, uh, 60 to 80 centimeter, it was quite good in 100% uh, in peat, but it's also good in 20% compost. And if you sum it uh, in 100% compost, 100% uh, peat, it was only 30% in the bit. In the best two classes and in 20% compost, it was 32% of the plants. So the amount of plants in the best uh, uh, best uh, two classes are uh, increased between uh, when you uh, added 20% compost to the substrate, to the growing media. Then it, it decreases with increasing compost contents up to 40%. And please don't ask me why, what is this? This is the best uh, percentage of plants in the best classes when you mix 50% compost in the green year. So, sorry, I can't explain it. We can't explain this. This, uh, this is what we have, what we, we were sure before it, it will uh, decrease the, the uh, number of uh, plants in the best uh, uh, classes, but um, this is for, we can't explain this finding. But if we um, summarize it, best results will be with cherry lowers in 100% peat, 20, and also in 50% compost. But please don't ask me why. So far, I can, cannot explain the results with 50% compost because the quality grading has become worse compared to 20% uh, with uh, 30 and 40% compost. Okay. Let's show, let's look at the uh, mean shoot fresh weight of the uh, cherry lowers and also the shoot lengths. The shoot lengths is the, are the dark green columns, the average of uh, the shoot lengths and the shoot fresh weight are the light green columns. And you see here the trend lines and you see with increasing uh, compost uh, co uh, contents, uh, the shoot lengths uh, decreases. And with increasing uh, compost contents, the uh, shoot fresh weight only decreases very, very slightly. Uh, yeah, that's it what I have uh, explained. But, but how can you explain it? Why is a shot uh, length decreases and the Short fresh weight will be will be more or less the same, and if you look at the number of shots or branches per plant, the average number of shots and branches per plant, you can see with increasing compost content, the number of branches per plant increases. Okay, but it is higher in the high compost in the growing media with high compost contents compared to 100% uh, peat. And so um, we think this with, with, that with increasing compost contents, the share allowance becomes more branch. So they become denser and more compact. And uh, the shoot length decreases with, comp with, uh, with increasing compost contents. And the increasing compactness explains why the fresh weight of the plants changes little 
with intrinsic compost, compost contents, and also the um, shoot length tends to decrease. The, yeah, the, 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 the more compactness, the more branching explains it, why that is so, the results. 50% uh, compost. And uh, visually, there are hardly any differences between the plants of the different treatments. And maybe they also become more compact with increasing compost contents. Let's look at. Here are the mean fresh weight uh, of the emerald green cedar and uh, uh, the width of the plants, the diameter on the butt, on the base of the shoot, we have measured, and that in, uh, depending from the compost content in the growing media. So you can see these are the shoot lengths. The shoot lengths will decrease with increasing compost contents, and the width of plants at the basis at the basis of the shoot, uh, it will increase with uh, increasing compost contents, and so. Also in Tuya, uh, in emerald green cedar, the shoot length decreases with increasing compost contents. You see it's a grass dark green trend line, and the width of the plant tends to increase, which you can see at the green, the light green uh, trend line. So in emerald green cedar also, uh, there is a fact that they become more compact with increasing compost contents like we have, like we have seen for the cherry laurel. Okay, and the last uh, experimental plan in this experiment was the uh, Golden Private, um, Ligistrum ovalifolium aureum. Uh, the same as you have seen, 100% P20, 30, 40, and 50% compost. And um, we can't see uh, any differences at those pictures. So they are getting slightly shorter, but let's look in detail. Um, are they getting, the question is, are they getting also shorter and more compact with increasing compost contents as we have seen for emerald green cedar and for cherry laurels? And looks at this, this is uh, also the average uh, shoot fresh weight and the shoot length of cherry laurels depending on the compost content. And you see the dark green columns are the shoot lengths, the average shoot length, uh, the mean shoot length, and the, the light green columns are the shoot fresh weight. And you can see the shoot lengths will not increase, not decrease. It is more or less the same when you look at the trend line. And uh, the shoot fresh weight will increase with um, with increasing um, compost contents in, this, in the growing media. So, golden private, shoot length decreases from 100% peat to 20% peat, very heavy, and then increases again with increasing compost content. These are the, deep, the dark green trend lines. And with uh, regard to the shoot fresh rate, the same trend can be observed also. Uh, uh, the differences between the individual treatments are more pronounced. And these are the light green trend lines. And if you look at the mean number of shoot and branches of the plant, and you see it decreases between 100% compost and to 20%, 100% sorry, to 20% compost, and then it increases to 30% before it uh, decreases again with increasing compost content, but it decreases very slightly. So the branching of golden private, um, of, it's a mistake, sorry. Uh, private unlikely cherry level does not increase with increasing compost content in the growing media, but rather decreases. And the plants that do not become more compact with increasing compost contents for Golden Private. Okay, let's summarize what I have shown you. It was possible, and that is very important, it was possible to produce good and sellable plants in, of high quality with all four experimental plants in all five 
substrate treatments. They are more or less all soluble. The, re the results could have been different with a wet and rainy summer. Like when we have done this, uh, uh, this experiment this year, the results may be different. Uh, as uh, it would be that then we have a de dependent on the drainage, the, 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 the result would have then depended on the drainage of the substrate. Um, with increasing compost contents in, this, uh, in the uh, growing medium, the roses bloomed later and showed reduced growth as soon as the content of the compost uh, uh, decree uh, yeah, was higher than 30% compost. Uh, because of the soil stress, uh, since they are potted bare rooted in the uh, at the beginning the roses, the shoot length of the cherry laurels and also the tuya was smaller, with simultaneously increasing branching of or increasing diameter of the shoot, so the plant becoming more compact. That was really good. With golden privet, uh, the fresh weight and the length thus of the shoot of 100% peat. Uh, um, to 20% compost reduces very clearly before it's uh, with further rising compost proportions again increases. I can't explain it, why it is so different in Golden Privet, but this was our observ observation. These are our results. An addition of 30% compost was justifiable under the condition of this trial, except for Golden Privet. For two year and cherry laurel, 40% and possibly 50% would also have been acceptable in 2020 with a dry growing season. Uh, with a wet growing season, I don't know, but for 2020, it works in this amount. The only problem is that the quality grading in mostly is mostly done primarily according to the shoot length in Germany. I don't know what it is in, in Ireland, but I think it's the same. Uh, uh, which, however, is a, it's ten, ten Okay. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I have a mistake sh shown here. Okay. No, uh, everything is fine. Sorry. Okay. However, it, uh, uh, they tended to decrease with increasing uh, compost contents. And so if the government will ban the use of, um, of uh, peat, so we have to discuss uh, new quality standards for uh, our um, uh, yeah, woody plants, uh, because when they get in compact, um, we, have, we need no quality standards. Okay, uh, I will show you now some uh, results from experiments with different substitutes in tree nurseries directly we have done in this year. We, on behalf of the Ministry of Agriculture, we have been carrying out a project, a scientific project since the end of 2020 to promote peat reduction in tree nurseries, peat re substitution of in tree nurseries. Uh, it's called TOSPA. It's um, in English. It is a model and demonstration project for the practical introduction of peat reduced substrates, growing medium media in tree nurseries. It's founded by uh, the government, uh, the, the Ministry of Agriculture in Germany, and this is uh, yeah the logo of our project. And for this purpose, five leading companies, uh, tree nurseries, have been selected from us, which we will further reduce the peat content in their current standard growing media over the next four years and use increasing quantities of um, peat substitute. The growing medium uh, will be developed together with the substrate suppliers. It's very important that they are that we will uh, uh, cooperate with their own substrate suppliers, um, the nurseries themselves and us, and we discuss it uh, the amount and the type of the peat substitute and in which and in uh, in which and in which number we will uh, number of plants we will uh, try this this uh, experimental substrates. And I will show you some first observation of the growing, uh, the growing season uh, 2021. 
Uh, I don't know, I think uh, all of you know the Cordes Young Plants in Bölzen. Uh, this is one of our cooperation nurseries uh, and the plants are Cornus, Ficus caria, Hydrangea paniculata and Deutzia. Uh, uh, these are all rooted cuttings in uh, um, uh, yeah, no, 0.5 liters, 500 milliliters square root, uh, square potted. Um, the common medium is 40% peat and 60% peat substitute, but let's explain later. This is very high uh, part of uh, peat substitution. Uh, the new TOSPA medium we have uh, tested this year was only 20% peat and 80% uh, peat substitutes. It would be cocoa uh, fibers, wood fibers, and also compost. And the experience this year so far was good in the uh, Bicordus tree nursery. We, uh, we have visited them several times. We have taken substrate analysis to uh, look at the physical and the chemical parameters, they all work well. But, and that is important also for the government in the discussion, young plants are especially cases for nursery sector in that the plants are grown in very small pots and mass, mostly under grass or uh, under glass and or fall in greenhouses, have short, very short cultivation, cultiv cultivation times and Therefore, the demands on the substrates, uh, structural stability of the substrates are not quite as high as in other tree nursery cultures grown in containers in the open field. So that is a big difference. So the, the high amount of peat uh, substitution in the standard media or uh, in, the, the, in our experimental, uh, experimental media is not the, the average for the uh, tree nursery sector in Germany. You see, this is uh, where we try the plants. This is for the Deutzias and the other plants standing in this uh, greenhouses you see here in the background. Next nursery was Heidon and Söhne. They grow uh, in this area, uh, in this um, experiment, right? Rebus alpinum, Lunit serranitida, and Capinos betulus, hornbeam in three liter, five liter, and also a container, and also in one liter pots. Common, they are use 100% um, peat, and they are very critical, but they, are, they will be part of this project. And the first step was to add 15% wood fiber to the, to the substrate, and their experience are good so far. It was not surprisingly for us because 50% peat substitution is not a problem for the tree nursery sector. These are the, 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 the picture of the uh, nursery Heidelnsöhne in Kleiner Alt Nordende near Elmshorn here in Germany, here in Schleswig Holstein. The third one is Heinz Klaasen tree nursery. I think um, it is not so, so common, but uh, they grow vaccinium um, blueberries in 7.5 liter containers, and they are, these are very specialized, spe specialized and Vaccinium has a high demand on the low pH, but uh, the common medium uh, is 60% um, peat and 40% peat substitutes. And in our experimental substrate this year, we reduce peat to 50%. And we have added perlite, wood fiber, and cocoa. So the, the amount of peat substitutes are, are 50%. And the experiments are good so far. The blueberry requirement uh, for the pH is a very low pH, and uh, it is uh, the special challenge here with the less peat in the green media. And we are not sure if we can reduce peat more than fifty percent to get a low pH in the in the growing media. So that is might be a problem in the next years. But we must show. Uh, but we were excited how uh, that the, the common medium are uh, reduced to 60% peat. They said it works. So yes, let's look to the future. These are the, our experimental plants here. They begin here and end it here in this plant. And you see with a, a TOSPA with fifth, only 50% peat, it also works. But the plants are getting slightly 
um, light green leaves compared to the normal growing deer. They have they are fertilized in the same uh, manner, but um, they are getting slightly uh, uh, light green leaves. Clasen and Co. I don't know if uh, I think Clasen and Co. will also uh, have uh, um, some people buying plants from the island, but we have tested Hornbeam uh, in 7.5 and also in 5 liter container, Copper Beach in 5 liter container, Privet, uh, Ligustum vulgare in 3 and also in 7.5 liter container, and Emerald Green Cedar in 5 liter container. The common medium has 75% peat and we reduce it to 50% peat uh, and to in, in one in the medium one and in the substrate two in the growing media two for this experiment to um, 60%. So with wood fiber, green waste compost here 20%, here 30%, and expanded clay. Uh, and the ex experiments are good so far. But let us look to more detailed results. And if you look at, the, at that picture for Copper Beach, grown in five liter container, and you see 75% peat. Uh, that is the common substrate here in that uh, nursery, in the Klasen Coop nursery. Here is 50% peat, and here is 40% uh, peat, and you see. Uh, um, uh, here is 20% green waste, here is 30% green, uh, uh, green waste, and you, as you can see at the picture, the plants getting smaller with increasing compost content in the green media, and also the horn beams. This is, uh, you see, this is the other side, not left, right is 100, is a common, the common substrate, and this is uh, twenty percent green compost, and this is uh, forty percent green waste compost. And as you can see, uh, the shoot length decreases with increasing uh, wood fire, uh, uh, green waste compost content. So the reason for the somewhat poorer growth and growth of beech trees in the media with a very high peat substitution amount uh, content and may be poorer. May, may the poor drainage of the media due to the high uh, compost content, 20 to 30 percent. And we have seen uh, Glasen and Co. Uh, also uh, normally irrigate very heavy because they, um, I don't know why we have discussed it with them and they mentioned, uh, please reduce your irrigation, but they want to irrigate it in that amount. Uh, and the summer in uh, the growing season in Germany was rather wet, so they get some trouble with the root growth in the, yeah, with less uh, uh, ration in the growing media with increasing compost contents. And you see, this is the average of shoot length in copper beech and hornbeam and in em emerald green cedar, depending on the peat content. We have measured 200 plants per treatment, as you can see. In Copper Beach, uh, the, the growth reduces uh, if, you, uh, if you reduce the peat amount to 40%. Uh, and in the Hornbeam, there are uh, distinct differences uh, depending from the, oh, sorry, that was a mistake. This has, been, has to be 40% and this also 40% peat only. You can see the average shoot length reduces heavily. Uh, in hornbeam with increasing compost contents and decreasing peat contents. And all, only the emerald green cedar, they, they are very good in growth, uh, also with 40%, uh, with 30% uh, compost in the substrate. Okay. And if you look at the quality of the percentage of plants in the different quality classes, you see it for hornbeam with a sub, uh, with a standard substrate. There were 28 percent in the big in the best quality quality classes compared to when we uh, reduced peat content to 40 percent. There are only 
51.5% uh, uh, of the plants in the best uh, quality class. And um, the percentage of hornbeam of best quality is getting smaller with decreasing peat content in the medium. But so far, the effect is only very small with copper beech and not observed, observed with emerald green cedar in this tree nursery under the uh, conditions of culture, under this uh, irrigation system. Okay, the last one of the five nursery was Cordes Rosen. I think you know them. Cordes Rosen are very popular worldwide. Uh, uh, they produce garden roses. We have a range of 20 varieties in that uh, in our experiment. And we have put them in five liter square roses container. The common medium has 20% peat and 25% peat substitutes. 50% uh, peat was uh, the experimental medium this year and 50% peat substitute, wood fiber, green waste compost, are the substitutes. This was 30% um, um, wood fiber and 20% green waste compost. And the experiments are good so far, but there's also a but due to the shorter cultivation period of two to three, three months until the date of sale, no high demands on, are made on the structural stability of the growing medium. And it makes easier to use larger proportion of peat substitutes. That is very important for the discussion with the government because they uh, they look very uh, very uh, specific to the results and they pick up only the best results for their uh, for them. And since the roses are potted bare rooted, soil stress could initially occur with high compost proportion in the medium. But I think. Um, the 20% composts might not be the problem this year. Maybe next year, but we will uh, reduce, we have to reduce the peat amount next year. So we are, yeah, we must show what the future will bring. You can see there are several results together with, um, with very popular um, um, tree nurseries in the Pinneberg region this year. But we, the question is how it goes on in the next three years and can we reduce it in higher uh, amounts of peat? And uh, I think we, are, uh, we do the experiments with very um, innovative companies. They are good at the markets and they are very innovative. And the question is when we go to a, to a normal nursery, what are the results there? And we are happy that we have Heidon and Söhne, which um, normally produces in 100% peat to get uh, more, uh, more results, which, are, which shows more or less the average over the three nurseries in Schleswig-Holstein. Okay, let's go on uh, to organic fertilization compared, compared to mineral fertilization. Donald, I hope I have some time left. Yeah, we, uh, we're running, that's about an hour now. Okay, so um, I will try to hurry. That's a little um, bit quicker if we can. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, the question is uh, in this, re in this um, experiment, is it possible to replace coated mineral fertilizer with organic fertilizer? Because the discussion is uh, very critical to microplastics in, uh, in, the, in the nature and also in, in the growing media. And so uh, the background is increasing sections of the society and the politics um, demand sustainable action from the industry and the consumers and also for the uh, 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 tree nursery. Increasingly, the production of woody plants and other ornamental plants is, at, uh, is also coming under public criticism that is uh, heavy in uh, Germany. The use of mineral fertilizers has long been criticized whether justified or not. And especially the use of coated fertilizers uh, are, uh, are discussed very uh, critical because of the amount of microplastics in the growing media and also in the plant which, which will plant in the 
in the open ground, in the normal ground. And I will summarize, this is so far no coated fertilizer will um, met the, the requirements of the Re European plastic strategy, which tells us that uh, is a micro that the, the, the that the shell uh, of the the, the the coat of the fertilizers has to be de degraded degradable within four years after the end of the the runtime of the fertilizers. This this is planned for uh, 2026. So we have said, okay, let's test some organic fertilizers because the discussion is not only in the government also in the in the trade that they want to make them more sustainable that they want to sell only organic fertilized plants um, we have used in this e experiment also a peat reduced uh, uh, growing media uh, which is 50 uh, percent peat and 20 30 percent cocoa fiber no sorry 20 percent cocoa fiber and 30 uh, percent wood fiber this was the this was the, was the, the elements in the uh, in the substrate we used um, the growth practice in in uh, in Schleswig culture is the fertilization with Osmocote Pro 5 to 6m with late potting termings after the middle of uh, April um, and the top dressing was only done for high uh, low consuming plants um, uh, with uh, top with uh, Osmocote top. And then the organic the organic fertilizers are um, from D DCM coxine that was a, a, a mixture of three different coxine fertilizers and the top dressing was done with Ecomix 1. Uh, this was Eco Extra, this was Horn and this was a fertilizer with the addition of Bacillus. And the second, the third, the second uh, organic fertilizer was uh, Howard Bjorga fertilizer. Uh, Organos and Vivianos. I don't know if you know them. I think they are only popular in Germany. And the top dressing was done with uh, the Organos fertilizer. And Provita, uh, it was a completely new uh, uh, fertilizer, organic fertilizer. When we have uh, tested it, it was called um, tree nursery fertilizer in German Baumschuldünger. And it's a new product uh, which will be uh, which was uh, introduced to the market in 21 after we were successful in our tests. And I will show you that we will be successful. Andreas, if I yeah. could just comment as well, the those products, the, the previous one you mentioned yeah. is uh yeah, this uh that, this, this the one. first one is the Yes, this is available in Ireland or should be available through Fruit Hill Farms. Okay. And DCM is distributed by Fargrow in the UK, who have a, a, a working relationship with a company called NAD in Ireland. Okay. Um, so that's, that's two suppliers for two of those products, but I'm not sure about the, the middle one you said. That's no, not how about good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So um, the experimental setup was, it was important. If you compare organic fertilization with mineral fertilization, the organic fertilizer must be um, converted by microorganisms. So you need more nitrogen in the substrate because um, it must be converted and it was partly fixed by the microorganisms. So our uh, target was to fertilize Seven, 750 micro, milli, milligram nitrogen per liter with the uh, uh, coated fertilizer with the Osmo Pro and 950 uh, milligram per nitrogen per liter in the when we fertilize them with the organic fertilizers. This was a table, a, bit, a little bit con uh, confusing. So let's uh, look to the um, to the results. We have high consuming crops, plants in our experiment. This was cherry laurel, novita, hypericum, calicinum, bax, and spirea cinerea gresheim. Um, we have um, the privet, we have the green cedar, and we have taxos, 
and we have Y Agila, which we tried, and these are less demanding crops for uh, for fertilization. Y Agila uh, is less uh, demanding or sensitive to soil stress because we pot it in bare rooted. That's a common practice in, in Germany to uh, pot uh, Y Agila bare rooted, and so the soil stress with high amounts of uh, uh, with fertilizer might be might be a problem. So we uh, we call them less demanding crops at the moment. We, put, uh, we have tried plants which come from uh, square pot, uh, approximately nine by nine by 10 centimeter, half a liter. Um, I think you, you know them, potting date was mid of April. And here are the results for the high consuming plants at the end of season. You see the percentage of cherry laurels in different quality classes, depending on the fertilizer treatment. This is was a standard with Osmocote Pro. And if you compare it with Provita, there are nearly no differences. Uh, Provita works very well compared to uh, Osmocote and the DCM, Cuxin, uh, and also the, especially the Biorga Variante don't work so good compared as uh, Provita but uh, DCM better than the Bioga variant. That is the one that is not, not used uh, to, to get in, in Ireland. Um, you can see the, uh, you can see some pictures here. Uh, the, we compare Osmocote to the uh, DCM fertilizer here to the Howard fertilizer. And you see here is a comparison Osmocote compared to Provita. And here are nearly no uh, differences between the plants. Looking to Styria, you see also Provita and Os Osmocote are more or less comp comparable. comparable. Uh, and DCM and also Biorga, the results are more or less uh, bad compared to Osmocote or, or, or Provita. And if you look at the pictures, you can see Osmocote compared to DCM and Osmocote compared to Howard Biorga. There are clearly differences, no differences, Osmocote compared to Provita. And you see also for box, um, the amount of plants in the best two classes are higher in Provita compared to Osmocote. And also uh, uh, compared between um, Biorga and Osmocote, they are more or less the same. The, the results are better in Provita and also in uh, Biorga. And in DCM, it is slightly better compared to Osmocote. And this you can see, the pictures show nothing. They are more or less the same high. So they are not typical. Or they, they are topical for, for, this, for this result, for this experiment. But if you measure clearly and uh, classify it in, in the percentage of quality classes, so you, you can see the differences, not at the pictures. And if you see for look for the hypericum calicinum, uh, it is the same. Uh, Osmocote and also Provita are more or less comparable. And Howard and Biorga, uh, DCM and Biorga might be a slightly, uh, yeah, a slightly not so good, slightly worse compared to them. And you can see its pictures, no differences at the pictures, but if you see the quality percentage of plants in the quality classes, there might be a difference. Um, yeah, these are the less demanding plants, uh, Golden Privet. Um, you see best is Osmocote, second best is um, DCM, third, Provita versus with Biorga. And you come, you see there are slightly no differences uh, at the, at the, for the privates when you look at the pictures. In Taxus, there are these are more or less the same results. Osmocote pro, uh, compared to Provita and uh, DCM and Biorga are slightly more worse. Uh, you see here DCM is the worst of uh, for uh, um, for uh, uh, fertilizer we tested in, in, in Taxus. Tuya, emerald green cedar, you see 
nearly no difference between osmoquote and Provita, and the DCM uh, treatment is also very good. Howard is slightly uh, uh, bad, is a little bit bad compared to osmoquote. Pictures so no, show no differences. And Vigila for the rest, bare rooted. If you compare it, best results are with osmoquote, second best with Provita, and it's getting more worse when you use um, DCM, and this is worst with Biorga. So these are the differences. If you see osmocote compared to DCM, there are clearly a difference. Also, osmocote compared to Biorga, and the differences are smaller when you uh, use Provita uh, organic fertilizer. To sum summarize uh, my findings, uh, the fertilizing uh, we are tested fertilizers, uh, um, organic, and uh, um, when we use them, this, the, the results resulted in a saleable quality in all fertilizers. The growers practice from SR as using Osmocote Pro mostly produce an excellent quality uh, and an excellent. Uh, uh, except for the common books, it was a slightly uh, worse compared to the other. Why? We don't know. To the organic fertilizer. In view of the rising temperatures, it may be necessary to consider whether a change of shorter run times for quartz fertilizers, the change from 8 to 9M to 5 to 6M, is traditional, traditionally in uh, uh, Germany uh, in mid of April. And we think we must uh, must do the change later in the beginning of May because um, with with higher temperatures um, the osmocote run five to six m which we use traditionally when we pot it at the end of April runs faster because of the higher temperatures. Uh, the, uh, we have seen that the osmocote five m was uh, empty at the end of August, so. Uh, normally, the grower would be uh, top dressed uh, his plants, but we we don't top dress them. Nursery grower, growers would top dress their plants treated with osmocote normally, with granular fertilizers or liquid fertilizers. It depends on the system. The fertilizer Pro, Pro Vita Baumschuldünger surprised with also excellent quality. So we was we were really surprised of it and. Uh, uh, I think it is more or less the level of Osmocote uh, Pro 5 to 6M, and that was really, uh, really, really good. Uh, properly, the trade will ban the use of coated fertilizer earlier than the government. I think growers should test the use of organic fertilization with its own woody plants, first in a smaller scale, later in a bigger one, to be able to react very fast if the ban of the trade should really come. If your trade will say, okay, next year we will stop the use of plants uh, uh, fertilized with, uh, with coated fertilizer, so you must have a plan to, to do so. In, in Germany, there are big companies which say we will reduce it, and the ban is nearly stands before. So yes, the, 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 the companies must, must, must uh, look how they can can uh, how they can fertilize their plants with organic fertilizers. It works with organic fertilizers, but it will certainly uh, be a little more expensive because if you use uh, organic fertilizer, you must you must top dress your plants uh, at least one time more than uh, if you compare uh, if you fertilize them with coated fertilizers. Okay. Short outlook. The uh, trial was repeated, repeated in 21 to check whether the co uh, comparable trend occurs uh, under the uh, conditions of 21. It's not yet completed, so I can't uh, give you some result. It must be emphasis that from the poorly legal point of view, a ban on plastic coated fertilizer cannot be expected in the next few years especially in Germany, I'm sure. 2026, which the EU was planned, is uh, not, uh, not re realistic for Germany. It will be later, but it will come. Nevertheless, NGOs, trade and consumers will 
make a rethink necessary in nurseries because the, 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 the NGOs are very important for the consumers and also for the trade. And they will say, we will make a ban for coated fertilizer. So that is important for you. Okay. Donna, maybe stop here. Okay. Next topic was the sodium sensitivity of cherry laurels, of different cherry laurel varieties during the growth in containers, only during the growth in containers, not in the open ground when the plant is in the open ground, but in containers. It's a very interesting thing, and it, we were surprised to do it uh, when we start this experiment uh, because. Uh, for us, it answers some uh, questions of why uh, cherry laurels re re in that, uh, react in that way. I will show you. you. This picture shows the typical symptoms of sodium uh, at cherry laurels. You see the necrotic root uh, leaf tips, and uh, uh, or here you see the necrotic leaf tips. This is the typical reaction of a sensitive uh, variety of cherry laurel to. Uh, sodium in the irrigation water for this. Background is um, the sodium mostly from irrigation water results in that, and it was a yeah results from the uh, experiment station in Bad Zwischen and also from the advisory ring uh, Baumschulen in Ellerhof. Um, pointed to the natrium, to the sodium, as a cause of that type of necrosis at the leaf edge and the cherry, of cherry laurels. Uh, and the natrium, the sodium content in the irrigation water in Ellerhof was in the first test, first year, only 22, uh, 25 ppm, and in the second year, only 14 ppm. And to uh, explain it, one ppm is one microgram, uh, micro, um, milligram natrium sodium per liter irrigation water and 25 all contents of sodium below 20 below 30 ppm was uh, was classified suitable for very sensitive crop plants from the laboratories in Germany so that was really really uh, uh, small amounts of uh, sodium in the irrigation water of our tests these are the varieties we tested under different uh, cultivation conditions. Um, the first condition was we, uh, we tested rooted cuttings in TB9. These are TB9s, we call them TB9, and they're standing in a greenhouse with watering with an over an irrigation boom. Um, it, it was important to know that there was no rain, so the rain uh, may uh, uh, um, dilute the water and dilute the amount of, so, uh, of sodium in the water. So here is no dilution of the, of the rain in a greenhouse. The second situation was um, in a, um, yeah, was in TB9 in the open ground on the container crop site uh, with com uh, irrigated with the watering boom. But you see it's a picture, it was raining and they still use uh, diluted the, uh, the, the irrigation water and uh, diluted the sodium from the uh, growing media. Um, so less uh, sodium takes um, up by the plants compared with plants growing in the greenhouse. And uh, the third one was cherry laurels grown in silica containers in a greenhouse with watering room. The same is uh, with uh, dilution of sodium. And the, the fourth one was cherry laurels grown in sweeter container outside on the container crop site with watering room. The grading, we graded the plants, uh, uh, the sodium damage, the extent of the necrosis at the leaf edge and the reeds and at the leaf tips of the leaves, of the plant leaves, and uh, the overall impression of the plants. And together, we gave them a grading. Uh, one was non-sodium uh, damage and a very high impression, very good impression of the plants. Three was slight uh, sodium damage or slight um, necrosis. Medium was five, strong was seven, very strong was nine. Um, 
a, it was a clear delimination of the assignment of symptoms it was sometimes difficult to do because of the bacterial buckshot in normal, in normal, in also normally, non, normally it is pseudomonas, not xanthomonas. This is not a, a, a critical, uh, um, uh, it's not critical. Um, and it was a problem to, uh, to look what is, is it a bacterial buckshot or is it a necrosis? or even a saturated leaf margin due to sodium. So that was a problem for us, but we have done it and I, we, I think we were successful to, to explain it. This necrosis is due to uh, sodium, you see here. Uh, these are typical buckshot symptoms. Uh, this uh, serrated leaf edge due to the loss of necrosis tissue due to sodium, when it looks like this. What a black wine we feel, but it's a tissue lost of, uh, because of sodium. And this saturated leaf mar uh, margin here might be uh, due to buckshot. It might be also due to, um, you see, this is more or less, uh, yeah, it might, it could be um, also buckshot. So we are not, not clear, but we try to. To, uh, to, uh, to make our grading. And um, often the, the necrotic dead tissue detached from the leaves, as you can see here, this is a necrotic uh, leaf. And you see here, this is a detached uh, necrotic uh, leaf tip, which was falling down. And then the leaves are looking like this. Uh, they are more or less looking like a black wine weevil head. Uh, it feed it, which uh, when they when they uh, detached the uh, tissue, which tend, then led to the more or less strongly saturated leaf tips and leaf edges, like you can see here. Saturated leaf tips are here, and leaf edges are here. These are the typical symptoms when the tissue was falling down. So, and now I will show you the result. Uh, as expected, the symptoms were much more pronounced in the greenhouse than outdoor on the container crop site. No rain, therefore also no dilution of sodium concentration in the greenhouse, more on, and stronger symptoms are typical for plant for varieties from the greenhouse. So, a very, very good variety in our result was uh, the variety Caucasica, very common in Germany. It was graded with a three, good. Um, and uh, there are only slightly, there's only, this uh, variety is only slightly to sodium. Very good, Novita. It is very, very common in the nurseries uh, in Germany today. It's very good. It's absolutely not sensitive to sodium. Very good growing. Now we come to the middle. This was Edna, and Donald told me that Edna was very common in uh, Irish tree nurseries. And you see here the typical symptoms uh, necrotic. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah. It's the mad margins of the um, of the leaves. Uh, it, it was graded uh, Etna with five satisfactory, moderate, sensitive to, um, to to sodium. And on the other side of the scale, very bad was Mari. I don't know if you know Mari. It was a very slow growing variety, and it's also common in uh, in uh, Germany. These are the symptoms. You see the necrotic tissue and also the, yeah, the saturated leaves. When they lost the, the tissue, it was graded with nine, very bad. And also outside, not in the greenhouse, you show, you can see the typical symptoms on Mali. Uh, it was only slightly better outside. And also Piri, also a, a very, a very, weak growing uh, um, variety of uh, Cheryl Laurels with typical symptom, which is also uh, graded with a nine, uh, very high sensitive to sodium. And to summarize it, 
uh, grade one, no sensitivity, very good was Genolia no Novita in our test. Slightly sensitive or good was, was uh, Veritiv Caucasica, Ivory, Pipiflora, and Sabeliana. Moderate sensitive, satisfactory, five, Baumgartner, Bertini, Diana, Edna, you see here, Green Mantle, Herbergi, also co common uh, in, in nurseries in, in Germany, uh, Renoes, uh, also Raimani, Rotonifolia, these are moderate, uh, sensitive, to, um, to um, sodium in the irrigation water when they stand in the greenhouses. Um, strong sensitivity, Otto Lügen was very common uh, uh, in uh, Germany and very strong sensitivity, uh, uh, insufficient uh, cherry brandy, Mari and Piri. And when you look at the findings from uh, from uh, the um, container growing site, uh, they are slightly better. So I don't, I don't want to show it here and at its side. When you grow outdoor, the container crop area, all varieties show weaker the damage from sodium due, due to the dilution. But uh, I will show it. You can see Genolia and Novita are uh, 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 graded with one. Caucasica, Linus, Mickey, Papiflora, Winterstar with two, slightly sensitive are uh, um, Gallo, Shipka Ensis, Macrophylla, four is between moderate and slightly sensitive Etna. You can see also in greenhouse, uh, outside of the greenhouse, it's somewhat sensitive to, uh, to sodium and moderate sensitive are Leander, Mari, and Piri. So you see, can see if you grow outside, the problems will be smaller with sodium in the irrigation water. Okay, that's it for sodium in the irrigation water. And you see, uh, uh, you, if you use uh, only rainwater to irrigate your plants, uh, I think they will grow good and they don't will show the symptoms of sodium necrosis at the leaves. And if you leave, uh, if you use groundwater with, with higher uh, proportions of sodium, it might be a small problem, but it's only a problem during growth in containers, not if they are planted in the open ground. Okay. Um, to come to the end, I will show you some sh quick results from a project uh, we are looking together with other experimental stations and universities for trees which are suitable for urban sites in climate change. It's a very important question, which trees will be successful to grow successful to grow in cities, in urban sites, uh, in times of climate change. You see trees are doing very, they're very good job there. It's a very high, high uh, influence on the uh, quality, life quality in, in cities, in urban regions. They uh, do good things for air quality. They are responsible that the real estate's value will be high in in uh, in, in regions with uh, which with much uh, uh, green areas and the real estate value will low in reason without green areas. They protect uh, against noise. Uh, they will uh, regulate the microclimate, and this is very important for the climate change. Uh, to give some examples, uh, uh, the CO2 budget, air purification, plants consume CO2, as yes, you can see here, and a big tree, uh, a beach, for example, approximately 100 years old, can process about 9,500 9, liters CO2 per day, and that is approximately that amount. Uh, of uh, uh, of CO2, which is formed daily by an inhabitant in Germany. So it is a big amount, which a 100 year old batch can uh, can store, can, can uh, this is very, very important. And a single 100 year old batch tree filters 
for example, an amount of fine dust out of the air, which is which corresponds to approximately that amount, which is produced by a car with a mileage of 20,400 20, miles per year. So that is very important. So if you have, uh, if you think you have 100 million cars in Germany, and you will have 100 million batches, which is uh, 100 years old or older, and it works good. So you can, no one has to talk about about fine dust. Okay, uh, trees cool the cities, like a natural air condition. Uh, cities are getting warmer and warmer. This is uh, typical for climate change. And um, the University of Wageningen has found out that the cooling capacity of a big single tree, I think a big single tree is also a bad beach, which is uh, 100 year old, uh, can be 20 to 30 kilowatts, the cooling capacity. And this is a considerable variable output because in comparison, a air conditioner of your room, of a single room, has around two kilowatts. So you can, can see this uh, cooling capacity of a green, of a single big tree. And cooling is very important in times of climate change for the cities. So the cooling effect of a green area in a city can be three to 11 degrees. It depends from the amount of water which a, cool, which a green area can can uh, can uh, can uh, use and the cooling effect works again uh, within a radius of up to 300 meters around this green area. So that is very important to have many many areas, small areas uh, with uh, with green to uh, reduce the temperatures in our cities in the time of uh, min uh, of climate change. So. This is the reason why we are, um, I think, uh, okay, I will show you some criteria for uh, what, a, what a tree which is suitable for urban region in climate change must have. It must have a high, and, uh, high heat and drought tolerance, but without water, no plant growth will survive. If you're waiting for plants which uses no water, you can wait as you alive. High winter frost tolerance and late, late frost tolerance. They high, must have a low demand on the location, for example, especially for uh, the soil, e.g. the pH, the soil compaction, poor space for root, root growth, low susceptibility to disease and pests, a high storm resistance because the storms are getting uh, more, more prob problematic in climate changes. The woody plants, from southeastern Europa, Caucasus, North America, and Asia are currently expected to have the highest future variability uh, from these regions where the climate is today as it is forecast for us. But what is exactly forecast for us? That is a good big question. Nobody can answer us ex uh, uh, so far. By the way, the exclusive use of native plants, which is very important uh, in uh, Germany, the government, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it, it gives a law to that you can use only native woody plants if you will plant them in the open uh, landscape, it will not crown with, with success in this context. So that is very important to know. So we test these plants in a project. Asa Bulgarianum up to Zelkova, Zerata, 20 different tree species and uh, varieties. And to give you a uh, summary uh, tested of the tested plants, very good. It, it was a green traffic light with stars in my uh, grading. It was a measure, the Mena ash obelisk that comes from the southeastern Europe and West Asia. It was a spades alder, alnus speti, it was a high hybrid. Uh, it is, well, was very, very good, a very good grower at all test sites of our test. Uh, the Vista Elm Rebona, almost Rebona, it was a breeding uh, product from the USA. It was a very good grower, uh, not sensitive to anything. It grows since five years to 
in uh, to an uh, enormous extent. So these uh, three varieties are tested at very good at the moment, but these are trends. After the competition of the establishment says it's a site, we tested them in cities, in five cities, four in, in Schleswig-Holstein and in Hamburg is the fifth site. And they have, we, we, uh, we, we, we looked at them for four years and uh, I think it's only trends after the competition of the establishment says at the sites in the cities. Turkey also works very well. Uh, it comes from Southeast uh, Europe and West Asia. It was also very good, successful, no problems. Good, only green lights, green traffic light was uh, sweet gum, liquidama styrociflua, Persian ironwood, parotia persica, Montpellier maple, Aza monspesulanum, honey locust skyline, the glycia, triacanthus. Skyline, the synonym, synonym was Sky Cool. I found at the RHS homepage, so I will give you Sky Cool is the same. Uh, North, Northern Japanese Magnolia, Magnolia Cobus was also good, but uh, if you are interested in fertilization, the, the leaf of Magnolia Cobus uh, tends to show uh, yellow, not really green, but it is normal. It, it, it's not a fact that the, the, the fertilization was uh, was bad. Uh, the, the, the normal green was a little bit yellow. Oriental plain, Platanus orientalis, works also good. In the five cities, the silver lime, Brabant, Iliotomentosa, Brabant, also good. And last but not least, the Japanese Selkova Greenways uh, works also good in our five cities. Satisfactory, only yellow light, traffic light. The maiden hair fastigiata, Ginkgo biloba fastigiata, it's an upright drawing variety, uh, works not so good. The hop hornbeam, Austria capinifolia. Um, at the beginning, we thought that it's very suitable, but uh, after that, um, they had a high demand on uh, good uh, irrigation directly in the first and third, uh, second and third year after planting at the site. So you must be uh, take care of them. Hornbeam, you have to if you plant hornbeam, you have to take care at the, uh, the at the irrigation at the site where they planted. American Ash Summit, uh, yes, also some small problems. Um, we don't know which is the reason, but there are some problems with it. The Hornbeam Lucas, an upright growing clone, very good, but um, also some uh, difficulties, some problems with the irrigation. So you must be also uh, take care of that plant if you plant them. Uh, with the irrigation, European European huckberry, Celtis australis, um, yeah, not really good in our uh, our results. And the Hungarian oak, Quercus raneto, is the third one, which uh, you have to take care with the irrigation. After that, if if you finish the competition and the the establishment at the uh, site. Uh, it may grow good, so we have to look uh, for the next five to ten years how they grow uh, on, on at the sites. But at the moment, the trend was only satisfactory. Unacceptable results at the moment, the treated maple Arza bulgariano, but the quality we get from the nursery was bad. And if you start a, re a test with bad trees, the results may be Bad because of the bad quality and that because of the, uh, the, 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 the the tree and themselves, the specific of the trees themselves. It may be the reason that they, the, the, when we planted the trees, the delivered quality of the plant was not so good. Japanese pagoda tree, Sephora, Japonica also was acceptable, unacceptable. It grows not good. Uh, so these are the results, 20 trees, and to, to repeat it, good was these uh, trees, and very good was Mena Ash, Beats Elder, Resister Elm, and Turkey Oak. They are very good, 
and to give a short outlook, which is which will happen next with trees for the urban sites in the future. The trials will have to continue for another five, 10 to 15 years be, uh, before we can make a halfway reliable statement about the sustainable uh, suitability uh, of the trees at the sites in the cities in the climate change. So four years is uh, much too less. There will not be uh, the one climate change. If someone is waiting for the one climate uh, change tree, uh, they will wait until he is 100 years old and older. Um, the trees currently being tested are not intended to replace the current uh, standard assortment, the standard uh, range of trees which are planted in the city, but to supplement it. Uh, that is important. The aim is to identify species and varieties uh, for as many different site situations as possible. You see, you will have compaction in the soil and used root uh, space. You will have uh, soils with uh, high pH. And we are looking for new variety species which can grow in these conditions. This is the reason why we tested the trees for climate change. Um, we need trees that work for climate change, need vital um, urban greenery to make the cities uh, livable, even in climate change. Uh, they have to clean air and tolerate temperatures, even in 50 higher temperatures, even in 15 years and also later. So we have to take time, but it's what uh, we have less time because the cities are asking what kind, which uh, tree can we plant uh, in our cities in times of uh, climate change. No matter what, our products have a very positive future in any case, especially due to the climate change. Our products bind CO2 and uh, thus one important answer to climate change. It is very important for the growers to know that and to make, to, to tell it to everyone that our products work uh, against climate, sh climate change and that are very, very, very important for us. So that are the outlook. Many thanks for your, your attention. Sorry for my bad pronunciation and for my, yeah, for my bad English. Are there any questions, if it is possible to have some questions? I appreciate yeah. that. You are happy to answer some, so either people can email them to me yeah. and I can send them to you or you can send them direct. Okay. But I really appreciate the time you've put into preparing this information and I know uh, you've had to, uh, I suppose, pull on some old uh, English speaking skills, but uh, it's been really interesting and especially uh, a view on some of the, the issues that we have to face in Ireland as well with growing media and with climate change. So on behalf of the, the growers here and, and uh, people watching, I'll just say thank you very much yeah. and um, appreciate your, your, your time and input. Thank you, Andreas. Okay. We, we appreciate his time in preparing the material. Um, just before we wrap up, I've got an opportunity there for some questions. Um, Andreas has said he will take questions either directly to him or if you want to send them through me and I can share the, the answers back. But there are some questions that have come in online. So we'll, we'll try and deal with them and they may be for Andy and Connor here. Um, and it might be for some of the, the wider groups. So I'm just going to go into the, the chat um, and have a look at them. And I also have a question there for Bart as well about cost of biochar and efficiencies. So the first question is, in the context of the effects of the sudden peat ban and proposed changes in the way land is used, is it not now time for the government to promote horticulture as an export-driven industry rather than a focus on import? Uh, I, I don't know who should address that question and maybe I'll leave it there or Dermot, we'll, we'll leave it there for a minute. Uh, I'll just read through these and then see maybe who's best to answer them. Can, can we take the example for nursery stock and mushrooms, a focus should be created on a limited pilot geographic area where long-term land leases are incentivized. Incentives need to be offered to existing growers. This will create the necessary critical mass of skills, contractors and suppliers 
these measures would be cost neutral. This has already been done for IT and pharma. Consequent increase in lobby power and research spending would help solve peat and other industry problems. Okay. Um, I'll throw that out to the floor if anybody has a comment. Dermot. Dermot, I'm gonna to have to give you this microphone, the other one's not working. Okay, just the general comment there about import substitution and export driven sector. I think they're, they're one and the same thing. Uh, the idea of developing the horticultural sector uh, will mean that we look at where the opportunities lie and we develop propositions, whether they be for import substitution or for export. I don't, I don't see a big difference. We have some very successful sectors in the horticultural industry. Uh, there's currently a, a plan commissioned. It fell from, from Food Vision 2030 strategy, which was launched, launched in, October, in August. Um, and one of the recommendations in that was that a roadmap for the development of the horticultural sector would be developed. Uh, the Department of Ag have commissioned that plan and it's currently in training and it's due to report in March next year. I think there's going to be a lot of detail coming together around where are the opportunities for growth in the sector. And uh, we're all involved in one way or the other, including stakeholders in this sector, are involved in the development of that plan. So I think we'd I'd leave that question at that particular point, if that's okay. Thank you. Jeremy, thanks very much. Uh, are there any questions from the audience here for Connor or Andy? No, okay. Uh, I have a question there for Bart, if you're able to join us just before we wrap up. Bart, I know you're, you're joining us from Belgium, just to remind people that. There's a question about, um, the costs of biochar and chitosan, and can they be reduced using or looking at the efficacy of scale of production or with new technologies for their um, production? Yeah, I think uh, the cost issue, it's, it's really important, of course. Uh, maybe first for the chitin. So we only tested chitin, not a, a chitosan. So chitin is like a slow release acting uh, source of chitin. Um, you use it in really small amounts. Uh, let's talk about two grams per liter of growing medium. So as such, the costs may be low because you only use a very small amount. Uh, but of course, yeah, the, the higher the production unit, um, the cheaper the product can be, of course. And then maybe the difficult case of biochar. Um, yeah, it's sure the, for sure that that biochar is very expensive. But on the other hand, maybe you can use biochar in growing media several times. So it's it's another way of thinking. I, it's not just starting at the beginning of the growing season with biochar and, and throwing it away at the end of the growing season. Maybe there is like a, we can we can find a system where you can use biochar for a longer period in a growing medium. And of course, if you can combine biochar production with greenhouse management, there can be multiple um, benefits of, of this combined system, maybe. Um, yeah. So it's the, the true circular economy. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. Bart, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to draw the seminar to a close. So Bart, uh, firstly, thank you very much for joining us from Belgium. Um, and we appreciate your time and your effort preparing your presentation and joining us this morning. Um, I also want to thank our other speakers Michael Gaffney, Kevin Mahan, Andy Burke, Connor McGee, and Andreas Freda, who joined uh, previous, prior to today. Um, I really want to thank everyone for coming here today. This is our first in-person seminar in Ashtown since uh, March 2020, so it's a, it's a big effort to get it up and running. And we have forgotten a few things since the last one and learned a few things as well running it today. So I, I wanted to say thank you very much to everyone who attended in person. And I would say a special thank you to everybody who joined online and persisted with us during some technical troubles early on. I hope the sound has been uh, very good since we, we ironed them out. So apologies again for the difficulties we had early on. Um, I suppose I, there's been a common theme throughout the presentations today and it's been about sustainability. And maybe on that last word that I touch on with Bart about looking at circular economy. So there's always change. Every time we, we have a nursery stock seminar, there seems to be difficulties, but we also have solutions there. And I know that growers have been adapting and changing. Some of it has been very accelerated and challenging, 
but we hope to be able to work with you to make some of those changes simpler. And that will take some time, but we, we will help you along that journey. Um, so thanks again for joining us today.